燃え上がれガンダム<音楽>I do, but you know, normally we start these episodes with. Well, okay, two things I want to say before we get into it. First, okay. we're sorry this is late. We uh-huh. promised this for December. December turned out to be really busy in both podcast land and personal life land. Yeah. So better late than never, but here we are. We finally have it, Gundam Sea Destiny podcast. But second, normally this is the part where you would say, Sean, you know, but I've seen it. Jonathan, you saw it for the first time. What are your thoughts on Mobile Suit Gundam uh-huh. Sea Destiny? But I actually want to throw it to you first, Sean. Because for the life of this podcast, <laughs> yeah. over a year now of Weekly Suit Gundam, a year and a half is what we're at now. This is, this is like a baby. It's a toddler now. It's 18 months. It can crawl. Can a baby walk at 18? I have no idea. Anyway. I don't know. I've never had a baby. So. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have two nephews and a niece. I probably should know this. Anyway, um, you have been for the life of this podcast cryptically mentioning this show uh-huh. over and over and saying this is one of the ones you were, you said at the outset the three you were most excited to do and felt like would be the most unbelievable to do would be just the original one just getting started yeah turn a gundam because yep. it's the holy fucking grail yeah and then gundam c destiny and i did not know for a long time because you really didn't tip your hand is that because it's in that zone is it because it's like kind of middling but has amazing parts or is it because it's just so bad it's good? Or is it something else? What is it that made you so excited to talk about Gundam Seed Destiny? I do think I know now, yeah. but I'd like to hear it in your own words. It's it's a, you know, and I feel like my relationship to Gundam Seed Destiny has always been very complicated. And I think watching it for a second time has not simplified anything. It's <laughs> no. made it more complicated. Um, because... It's it's a thing where, and I think I, I'm we we had a text conversation back and forth the other day after you finished watching the show. I've um, been talking about when are we going to do the podcast, all that kind of stuff. Um, and and you asked me like because you knew that like this was either like this was a show that I was interested in, and I sort of suggested this like oh, this is like one of my least favorite Gundams. And you're like, is there going to be worse stuff in the future? And and I basically said that. There are there are more boring Gundam shows that we have yet to watch. I don't want to mention them because I don't want to call your opinion. But I, in my opinion, there are a couple of Gundam shows in the future that are less interesting than Gundam Sea Destiny or more boring TV shows to watch. But there is no Gundam and maybe no TV show, at least I have ever seen, that is more fucking infuriating than watching Gundam Sea Destiny because it is a show that has... Um, more good ideas than good shows have good ideas. It has one hundred percent. It is overflowing with incredible concepts and things that you're like, oh man, this is such a cool idea for character. This is a cool idea for setting. This is a cool plot twist. This is a cool theme to go for. This is like whatever. Like there's so much great stuff around the edges of Gundam Sea Destiny, and yet it never really executes on maybe any of that stuff. At any point in the, over the course of the entire show, it's just gesturing towards here's good ideas, and you don't know. Do they just not realize they're invoking this really good idea? Um, do they know they're doing that and just don't know how to execute it? Like, what's going on with this show? And it's all over the place. It's two shows stuffed into one TV show um, that is always at conflict with itself. And then at the end, it just has like the most 
jaw-droppingly awful fucking last episode, or last two episodes. I originally watched the HD remaster version, um, which because they, I wanted to watch the version that just had all the shit in it, because I didn't know, I didn't want to spoil myself on why is there an extra ending, what is going on with that. Like, I'll just watch the one that has all that stuff cut into it together. Um, but that doesn't make the ending any better. Uh, but anyways, the last episode or last two episodes, if you're watching the HD version, are just awful, 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 awful. And, and you just watch this show that at times was very entertaining, had a lot of interesting ideas that maybe sparked your imagination. But at the conclusion, when it goes across the finish line, I like have no other thing to say to this show other than that it is a failure of a TV show in a way I've never ever seen a show be a just a failure of a TV show, which is what Gundam Sea Destiny is to me. I agree with every inch of that. Every inch. And yet... I am similarly conflicted because I have trouble calling this a bad show for all the things I do like about it. Mm -hmm. And I even have trouble saying it's the worst one we've watched because I did find it more interesting and engaging than Gundam Wing. But it's definitely I, more entertaining than Gundam Wing. It I'll is definitely it more entertaining. Now, I do think Gundam Wing, for all its flaws, is a much more coherent and successful show. Like, Gundam Wing has a pretty good ending. Yeah. Like, its final episode is one of its best. It has a pretty good beginning. It has a lot of rough stuff in the middle, but it's got characters I like, and I don't think it, like, fundamentally betrays any of its characters in horrible ways. Or it's maybe, fun like, fundamentally betraying the very foundation of Gundam itself, which I think is kind of yeah. what Destiny does at the end, yeah. which we'll talk about. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, like, you know, it's, it's Gundam Wing is more consistent as a production, all these things. Um, so, yes, it is... I am so conflicted because there are things I genuinely love about Seed Destiny, and I do think there are points where it comes pretty close to realizing itself, and then it just, it's like it's got it, and then it just slips. And, and then and you're go. left sitting there not understanding what just happened, right? right? It's this feeling of like, but you had all the things set up, you had all this stuff going on, and then it's yeah. just like, and then you're presented at this fork in the path, one fork leads to heaven, one fork leads to hell, and every time it goes to hell. And yeah. like, why are you doing this to me? You there fucking is, mad show. I will just say, there is a stretch around the middle, which is the, and I would call it roughly the Stella arc. Yeah. Which is the only sustained part of the show that actually invests in Sheen as the protagonist and main character. Uh -huh. It is the only extended part of the show where you can accurately point to him and say, that is functionally the protagonist of this show. And it is the best stretch of the show. Oh, yeah. I think it has one genuinely all-time great Gundam episode in there. The episode called Stella. And I think it has a bunch of great ideas that come so fucking close to turning this show into what it should be. And then just slip. And, and yeah, and then it transitions into, like, the like most extended worst section yes. of any Gundam show we've yes. watched. Like, Gundam Wing, even its nadir, doesn't have anything as bad as, like, the last ten or so episodes no, of Seed Destiny. No, the, the final core of Gundam Seed Destiny is... Abysmal, yeah. I did abysmal. Like, and and also just as a production, I have so many questions for you, Sean. On uh -huh. the like, do you have a production history for me? This is the only show I have seen that in its closing episodes, the fourth to last episode, <laughs> yeah. is a fucking recap episode. Uh -huh. And not a very good one. Like a really lazy recap yeah, episode. Yeah, a weird like stealth recap episode where you start watching it and think, this is not a recap episode. And then five minutes in, you're like, wait, is this actually a recap I've been episode? watching a music montage for five minutes. What is going yeah, it's on? It's like, at what point did this go from a new episode of this TV show into a recap? I don't even know yeah, how they did Like that. you basically watch the show immolate in front of your eyes over the course of the last ten episodes or so until it is nothing at the end it is yeah. just and that that final episode it, so so i so let's be clear about what we watched sean right yeah so we as with mobile suit gundam seed the success the predecessor show we watched the original 2003 2004 in this case um sd four by three production uh 50 episodes in both cases with the recaps in there and everything that's what we watched and for mobile suit gundam c destiny this is even weirder because what they did is the ending episode 50 is so bad that a couple months later they did like it was on television but also as an ova it was it was sunrise's christmas present to the world because it aired on december 25th oh my god yep, um oh my god <laughs> anyway um it, it, they did an extended like 45 minute version of that episode with more stuff in it and then for the hd remaster they cut one of the recaps and then they split that into episodes 49 and 50. And that's what you saw the first time. Yeah. Um, but this time we watched it this way. So I watched 1 through 50. Got to that final episode, which is like, what, the final power, I think is what it's called? Yeah. That is the worst episode in the history of Gundam. 
And I think I, that probably will stay the case through the rest of what we're watching, Sean. Yeah, like off the top of my head, I could... Yeah, there's... It's, it's bad. It's it very, is. It's, fin- it's one good. of the worst episodes of television I've ever seen. Yeah. And it is easily the worst series finale for anything I've ever seen. In terms of an intended series finale. Like, right, yeah. It wouldn't be fair to compare it to, like, a canceled TV show, because this this wasn't... They knew how long they were going. They no. just didn't plan yeah, for this, it. I mean, this hit its exact 50-episode order count. Yeah. Like, there's no... We pulled episodes or whatever, no. and it got cut short. No, it's like, they wanted 50 episodes, and we got them. Yeah, 50, we got them. Uh, and then I watched the uh, extended version of that ending which is what was then used for the HD remaster yes, and that's... somehow it made me even angrier because in some ways I think it's even worse while also being better yeah. I don't know um, so that's what we watched um, you know I will say I did go over and check the HD remaster the same way I did for Gundam Seed it's horrible yeah. what did they do it looks like it looks much worse than the original show somehow because I do think one thing I would praise see Destiny for is I think it has for the time and the technology very good animation. Yeah, uh, it's awful in the HD remaster. I don't know what they did. Yeah, like I, that's one of the reasons why when we were doing these, I'm like, I'm even if we because I was unsure whether or not we would do the HD version for Seed, but I was like, we're definitely not we should do the one for Seed Destiny because it was that. Again, like the I originally watched the HD version entirely just because I knew there was some bullshit around the ending of Seed Destiny by looking at the Wikipedia, but I didn't want to read too much of the detail of it because I didn't want yeah. to be spoiled because, you know, for context, I watched Gundam Seed and I'm like, this show is fucking great. I loved Gundam Seed so much the first time I watched it. It's like, that kicked ass. Time to watch the sequel. I had no idea. I had no conception. I had not heard anything about Seed Destiny at all. No yeah. idea if it, people liked it, people didn't like it. I was like, awesome, they made a sequel. I'm really excited. I don't want it to be spoiled because I liked Gun of Seed so much. Oh, well, they did the HD version. Ah, fuck it, I'll just watch the HD version because it cuts all that shit together, is like, was my understanding. Um, and so that was the version I watched. And the HD version does not make any, from what I remember or what I've looked at, Does it, it doesn't make any, like big changes in the way that like there are a couple of those either little or like added scenes in Gundam Seed's HD version that are like fairly significant um and somewhat controversial yeah and somewhat controversial Seed Destiny doesn't have much in that uh, regard it's more just like it's a much lower production effort because as happens with all of these kinds of things like Dragon Ball Kai went through the exact same thing uh it, it's cool to do a big HD master and do new edits and all that kind of stuff, but it's never going to sell well enough to do that for a 50 episode TV show to then warrant doing it again for another like 50 episode or longer TV show. Um, you also see this a lot of times with like American like TV releases that get like, oh, the first season gets like a really nice Blu-ray remaster and they're like, let's just sort of like do the bare minimum for season two because this didn't sell enough to warrant the amount of work. Right. And see, Destiny had a similar thing with this HD version where it was a lot lower effort and they did do some stuff of like they sort of made a lot of the stuff that they reanimated with the characters particularly the female characters they like made more sexy in yeah. ways that it's just like this is fucking sucks it's also just like the, the new character animation looks like they did it and then rubbed vaseline on the lens uh-huh. it's very blurry i know it doesn't have a lens it's digital but yeah. you get what i mean anyway um so whatever the case if you're going to watch see destiny i'd recommend the original version um but yeah it's funny you say that, Sean, that you had no idea. I had no idea C- what C. Destiny's reputation was. Well, I've been hosting a podcast, and I'm our public face on Twitter. Yeah. I did not have that privilege because I have had, Sean, a solid year of people giving me the same kind of cryptic comments you did uh-huh. and going, oh, just wait till you get to Gundam C. Destiny. I would tweet something like, man, I've loved every Gundam show so far. Be like, just wait until you get to Gundam C. Destiny. Uh-huh. And I've been having so many of these. Uh, and then there are some people who also hate Seed, and we are not in that camp. We, yeah. we like like the original seed quite a bit i might like it a little less new, <laughs> but we'll talk about that yeah um so i that's where i was coming in with it was like this like t- trepidation of like what is this fucking show 50 episodes and several months later i don't think i can answer that question but i can tell you a little bit about why it's so weird yeah and 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 having now seen it twice i don't know if and having seen it twice and done more research into his production than for any other gundam show we've done by like quite a bit I still have fucking no idea. Like, I don't know what happened with this show. I don't know what it's... I don't know what they were trying to do. I don't know, like, how it ended up this way. I don't know what the fuck anything with Sea Destiny is. I'm more confused by it now, I feel like, than I was um, five years ago. Um, Because it is a show that, like, you know, I watched it five years ago. I fucking... I think I had a similar experience to you, Jonathan, as you did on this first watch through. 
I'm just saying that assuming you're eventually going to watch it again, obviously, when you do it again, at least you've gotten them too. Um, here we go again. Um, but of like for like Stretch is being very interested in it, and particularly in that middle stretch with Sheen being like, ah, oh, man, he's so I really am fascinated by this character as like a Gundam protagonist. is really interesting. They're doing cool stuff with it, and then I think like by the time I got to the end, uh, that ending was so awful that like I couldn't hold anything but just like contempt for Gundam Sea Destiny in my heart, um, especially like over the years, right when it like recedes into memory. All those things about that middle section of the show that I enjoyed, I had like forgotten about completely. And it was just this like seething frustration with this show and the way that you sheen and the protagonist stuff and the returning characters and all that. Like this just sense of like, this is one of the most fucking ass backwards, ridiculous bullshit sequels anything I've ever seen. It's been something I've always wanted to talk about whenever we talk about any kind of sequel. Yes. I've always wanted to be able to talk about Sea Destiny when we talk about Star Wars. Um, Last of Us Part Two was one I thought about Sea Destiny a lot in terms of like different approaches to making sequels um, and all that kind of stuff. And it's been locked up inside me. And then watching it again, I had this weird experience of being like, oh, there, there is good stuff in here. Like there are really enjoyable stretches of the show. But when you know what's going to happen at the end, it's like you cannot... Like, as a self-defense mechanism, it is impossible to get infested in the character of Sheen. Right. When you know what the ending is going to be. And it's like a weird, tragic version of watching the show where, you're, where you know exactly what happens at the end. And you see the possibilities, but you know that it's, nothing will ever happen with them. And it's just like, I just can't believe in you, Sheen. I can't care about you. Like, it's just not humanly possible because it would hurt too much to go through that experience again. Because I want to stress... This was not a difficult watch for me. Uh -huh. Like, this is not like I kind of struggled through the early section of Gundam Seed. For for some of it being, I do think that show just kind of has a weak opening. Mm -hmm. And some of it being, I think, I wasn't quite sure where the show was going until it picked up for me. Uh, or like Gundam, Gundam Wing I actually watched very fast. But it was like, I was really like pushing myself through the last half of that show. Because it gets kind of boring. Um there was none of that with this. Like, I did take a break in the middle because we were doing so many other things, but it was not like a, I'm not enjoying this, so I'm not watching it. It was even when the show was utterly infuriating me, like standing up and la yelling at the TV, what are you doing? I didn't actually do that, but I felt like it in my head. I did that a couple of times. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, like, what are you doing? And then I would play the next episode. Like, it's not like one of those things where it's like, and then I would walk away in a huff. It was really like, I, this is fascinating. Episodes kind of fly by. Because it is like, it, there is so much going on that is deeply fascinating, some for good, mostly for bad, that like it is a captivating watch. Uh huh. But, and it, it made me realize captivating does not have to be a quality judgment. <laughs> exactly, yes. I mean, that's what, when I said at the beginning of that for me, this show is a failure of a TV show, that's like, I don't know if I would call it a good TV show. I don't know if I would call it a bad TV show. To me, like, Gundam Sea Destiny is beyond I the, agree. the scope of that kind of assessment. It is All I can say is that I think it fails at being a TV show basically by the end. Yes. Um, in a way that I've never seen. Like, you know, I watched, I binged all through Game of Thrones like a year, a year and a half ago. Um, and that has like a phenomenal or an infamously now terrible last season. And it is a bad last season of Game of Thrones. He's got fucking nothing on Gundam Sea Destiny's <laughs> last 10 episodes. Like, not even close. Protagonist characters are protagonist characters in Game, Game of Thrones. Yeah. That's not the case in Gundam Sea Destiny, which is something I've never seen in another season. It's story. not like Tyrion disappears in the last season exactly. of Game of Thrones and you're like, where'd Peter Dinklage go? I liked that guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. So do you want to do our, our little history lesson as yeah. you like to do here? So I'll do my best in trying to go through this history lesson because we're reaching the point now with Gundam shows where they are modern enough that they, you know, they've come out in the period of like the modern version of the internet, right? It's so much so that like in trying to do research for this, I went into Google and like limited my Google searches to like 2004 to 2005, just to, like see if I could find anything that was would like clarify some of the response and stuff like that of the show in this period, mostly unsuccessfully, partially because the Japanese internet is difficult for me to parse um, and partially because it's just, I think everything around the show is just confusing. Because um, what that also means is that we're in the era of disinformation about shows exactly. and fan communities. Yeah, and so trying to sort of pierce through the like veil of bullshit fan rumors and stuff 
um, around C Destiny was pretty difficult. Um, so I've I've found like a bunch of stuff that is like actual source quotes from interviews. So like I'm fairly confident that everything I'll talk about here is like at least a certain degree of like verifiable and real. Um, but it was a long journey of going through like this weird filtered process of um, the like, you know, if you're Googling about Gundam Seed Destiny and trying to research it in English, what you're finding is stuff that comes so like, it's like seventh hand or something ridiculous because it's the show originally aired in Japanese, it, obviously in Japan. Um, then the Japanese audience has its reaction to the show. Um, there are real like interviews and things with voice actors and, and animation directors and people working on the show that gives you some insight that it did have a fairly troubled production. Um, but those things then get filtered through fan communities that then like create kind of bullshit versions where they kind of amplify things that are like vaguely implied and things like that and create like bigger versions of rumors and come up with, oh, well, this like, there was something weird happened because this voice actor didn't reply prize this role. So obviously like the director was cheating on his wife with this person and blah, 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 and like creating conspiracy theories. And then those end up getting poorly translated into English by English fan communities. And then that gets disseminated across the internet over the course of 15 years through like forums and fucking, you can just find weird game facts posts from 2008 of people talking about Gundam Seed Destiny and just saying a bunch of horse shit that's not true. Um, and it's like trying to rip through those, that web of lies. I am very grateful. I am competent enough in Japanese to be able to like read some Japanese Wikipedias <laughs> because yes. if I could not do that, I think it is impossible if you do not know a decent amount of Japanese to be able to know anything about the production of Sea Destiny and be confident that it's true because there's so much bullshit that goes around on the English internet about this show. Um, well, there you go. This this is not many podcasts have a Japanese speaker here. So yeah. there we go. So it's, you know, if you if you want to do your own research, you know, research or beware because there is it is like and some of it is like some pretty like unpleasant rumors about like people specifically that is just like clearly not true and it's like man people yeah. on the internet suck. Um, but so that's that's all the preface for like how I kind of did the research and sort of tried to work through and a lot of this is stuff that I've tried to source through the actual Japanese sources um, to get good information. So so let's travel back in time to two thousand four. Um, so in 2003, Gundam Seed ends. Gundam Seed, hugely successful, very popular show, like sells well, people watched it, people liked it. Um, so Sunrise then green lights a three part movie compilation version of it, the Gundam Seed Special Edition movies. Um, that a lot of that material is where a lot of the HD version material also comes from. So if you watch the HD version of Gundam Seed, most of the additional content or like notable changes really comes from the special edition movies. And those are kind of like, you know, went through in time into the HD version. Uh, and so those movies come out in fall 2004. Um, one movie comes out in August, one comes out in September, one comes out in October. But they had been working on the movies all across the year 2004. Basically the same team that worked on Seed, including director Mitsuo Fukuda and the writer Chiaka Motosawa, or Chiaki Motosawa, who's Fukuda's wife, um, worked on the movies as well. In October 9th, 2004, which is two weeks before the third special edition Seed movie comes out, the first episode of Seed Destiny airs. So that's to give a sense of perspective on the production of this was extremely tight because it was the same team working on all those projects, Gundam Seed, Seed Special Edition, and Seed Destiny. Um, same team, Special Edition and Seed Destiny were basically in pre-production production around the same time. Um, and so that's where you get, there are lots of quotes of people involved with the show, including Fugita, the director himself, who talk about sort of after the fact that yes, like the, some of the production elements of Sea Destiny were fairly rushed because they wanted to sort of capitalize on the popularity of Seed. They sort of forced through a sequel very quickly, um, which is very, like fairly unprecedented in the history of Gundam. Like the closest equivalent would be Double Zeta, but Double Zeta had like a lot of different people working on it that were in pre-production while Zeta was ending. Um, and Double Zeta has its own cast and that kind of stuff. That's like that Double Zeta gets to kind of be its own show, particularly in that early section, um, because it was in pre-production as Zeta was ending with some different staff members and a slightly different team, obviously with some crossover. Um, typically speaking, Gundam shows, each Gundam show is a totally different beast. It's made by a different team. Um, it might have some shared staff members that, because it's Sunrise as a production company that's working on it, but generally the creative staff 
like the big creative people cycle out for each new show. Certainly once you're past the era of Tomino. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like the era of Gundam that we've just gone through of like all of 90s Gundam preceding Seed, it's a different like major creative staff working on the show each time. For this one, they just kind of like really wanted to get through this sequel and capitalize on the popularity of Seed because again, Gundam Seed was the most popular Gundam had been since like the mid 80s. Um, and so they really pushed for that. And that has caused, causes this really kind of rushed production um, that then is sort of part of the source of a lot of the difficulties with the show, clearly. And then those difficulties give rise to the fan rumors and stuff like that um, later on. So they make uh, Gundam Sea Destiny. It airs 2004 to 2005, October 2004 to 2005. Um, then in on Christmas 2005, they do the 51 uh, special extra ending. They also have an OVA called Stargazer, which did you watch that? No. Yeah. I, I was a little done with Gundam, yeah, I gotta it's, admit. It's not required viewing. I, I told, sort of told you, yeah, you can watch it if you want to. It's like a 50 minute, like total original net animation thing. So it's like, there's some other uh, kind of cosmic era Gundam Seed type stuff that is happening around there. And then they also, after Gundam Seed Destiny ends, they green light a movie that enters pre production with a script written by Chiaki Motosawa. Um, as far as I know, like the story treatment was completed by Motosawa, and then the movie production basically halted. Um, and it is technically still, it still exists in some form, theoretically, because Team Revolution, two years ago now for the 40th anniversary, said, as far as I know, they're still doing it. Um, but so, you know, they kind of start up some of these projects and things like that to sort of keep the Cosmic Era thing going. And then I think some of it, uh, Fukuda and Motosawa, they don't really do anything much out after uh, Sea Destiny. I think there's a sense of like fatigue in Cosmic Era, partially from the creative staff, um, that then causes them to sunrise to transition and start a whole new show with Double O Gundam, which is that same model, new staff, totally cycled through. And they've never done a sequel since then other than with like Build Fighters, right? Yeah, it's only like the weird spin-off stuff that they've they've kind of gone back to the sequel territory. Um, so Sea Destiny just sort of stands fairly unique as this what sometimes feels like this sort of potential second long-running Gundam continuity like Universal Century um, that is cut short. But Seed Destiny, while it is airing, is not unpopular. Um, it's not as popular, it doesn't get as good ratings as the original Gundam Seed. Um, but certainly while it was airing, it was reasonably well-liked. Um, I was reading something interesting about this. It was this that time slot on, I think it was MBS, my Nietzsche Broadcasting System, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That aired it. Um, that time slot was Gundam Seed, then it was the original Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah. Then it was Gundam Seed Destiny. That was like a crazy popular time slot for those three years because those yeah. were three super popular shows. Yeah. And so at the time, it was fairly well liked. Um, obviously, if like you go back and like read reviews at the time by the fan community, it is. I think it was a fairly contentious show, but certainly to like the general audiences, they seem to have fairly liked Gundam Seed Destiny. Although over time, its popularity has fallen. Uh, in the 40th anniversary, uh, like big sort of collection of rankings of the different Gundam shows. Out of 40 um, things that they ranked, which includes OVAs and movies, like separate movies, so all the Gundam original trilogy are ranked separately, that kind of stuff. Um, it is ranked at 14, so it's one below Turn A Gundam, which is 13. So it's like, it's not like in the upper echelon, for reference, Gundam Seed is number three, right? So it's like, it's not like up there is like one of the fan base's favorite Gundam shows, but it's not like one of the ones that people really don't like. Like it's above something like, um, Victory Gundam, it's above After War Gundam X, it's above Double Zeta. Insanity! Like, all yeah. of that is insanity. All of them you are, just named yeah. three great shows. Yeah, those are all, obviously, I think, much, much better shows than Sea Destiny, but, you know... More people have seen Sea Destiny. Yeah, way more people have seen Sea Destiny, certainly than Turn A Gundam. Like, I've, I'm always sort of happy to see the Turn A Gundam is at least 13, because I know it's a relatively underwatched show in the fan base, both over here and then also in Japan. But point being that, that Sea Destiny is fairly popular. It's fairly well liked, broadly speaking, even if I think in the like the dedicated fan community, it is a very contentious show. Um, but one thing that is an indicator of um, I think where some of the where Sea Destiny's lacking success is in the plastic model sales. Um, so Gundam Seed was very good at selling plastic models, um, which is one of like the main ways that Gundam shows are profitable. And Gundam Seed Destiny basically had um, 60% of the total plastic model sales that Gundam Seed had in the equivalent time frame. 
Um, so it's a pretty dramatic drop in interest in the plastic models. And I think it's clear why, um, because there aren't the a lot... suck yeah, in this show? There aren't many new mobile suits. Most of the mobile suits are literally like, here's a Zaku or here's a Goof, which Zakus and Goofs are great, but they've already got a bunch of Zaku and Goof And they're not like models. rethinkings of those in the way some shows do. They're yeah. just like... No, it's literally, here is a Zaku, only it has right. a sword instead of an axe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then the new Gundams are basically the same thing as the old Gundams. Like, the Strike Freedom is basically just a Freedom Gundam with, like, some gold stuff on it. I think it's cooler than the Freedom Gundam, but it's basically just... If I already owned a Freedom Gundam plastic model, I would not buy a Strike Freedom, right? The Impulse yeah. Gundam, Sheen's original mobile suit, is basically just the Strike Gundam from Gundam Seed. The same with, like, the swapping parts. Like, so, I think, like, both... If the show's not super popular with the core fan base... Uh, like plastic model sales will fall and then also the show I just think like the way they did the side like the approach they decided to take with the mobile suits it's like well there aren't a lot of good when, mobile suits when in you here. talk about like the rushed production and that the same team was basically working solid on Gundam Seed stuff for like three years yeah it makes a lot of sense why oh okay Kunio Okawara and his like design team maybe just didn't have time to make new Gundams because they're all this, there's nothing new in this show. Yeah, it's like it's like vague tweaks, you know, like Ray's Ray the Barrel's uh, mobile suit he uses <laughs> in the last five episodes or whatever is like the one that Raul Cruz had with with slight tweaks. Which that from a narrative perspective. That makes sense. He's a clone of Raul Cruze. But from a we want to sell toys to kids perspective, this is like, well, that's not going to do it, guys. Like, you yeah. need to sell a new toy to new kids. You can't just sell, like, the same one with, like, the weird backpack on it that Raul Cruze had at the end of Gundam Seed. I mean, and it leads to, like, it's and it's not just a problem with toy sales. It leads to the problem of, like, Kira and Sheen in the last half of this show are piloting visually mostly identical mobile suits. Yeah, the Destiny and, and the Strike Freedom are very similar. I mean, guns. they both use the blue, yellow, red color design of the original yeah. Gundam, which is utter madness. Like, that you couldn't at least do a palette swap on one yeah. of them. And they both, like, the main deviation both of them have from that core color scheme, scheme is they have a lot more black in them. But they have a lot more black in the same places, in the yeah. same way. So when they are fighting... Just for me, like like looking at like if you gave me pictures of the two of them, I could probably tell them apart. But in motion, it's so hard to tell which is which. Yeah. Um, so that's a problem with the production of the show. Um, and then in terms of like behind the scenes, what was going on um, outside of just like, hey, we don't have a big production, like a good production pipeline and all that kind of stuff because we're just rolling right off of the last show into this one. Um, there, are, there's a lot of information floating around the internet about like different like behind the scenes controversies and stuff like that. Um, and th a, lot, a lot of these specifics that you might find are either untrue or like exaggerated. There are kernels of truth to a lot of the stuff that, that goes around online. So one being, so Fukuda Mitsuo, uh, the director for the shows, again, the same director that um, Gundam Seed had, he uh, feels like he did not have a very clear vision of what Gundam Seed Destiny was going to be because a lot of interviews he gave before, during, and after the, the show have like fairly different answers um, of stuff like he before the show airs, he has a quote of this like, you know, Gundam Seed Destiny is all the show all about exploring war and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, he gives an interview in like 2007 where he says, Gundam Seed Destiny is the, it, literally the first line translated by me is, Gundam Seed Destiny is not a show about war. It is a show about competition and like, like people, like people striving and competing and trying to sort of. You can't be stagnant. You have to sort of compete and move forward, and that's what it means to advance as humans. And that's what the show is. Um, and it's like it's very funny on the Wikipedia when they have like these two quotes that are like right near each other, where he's like, "God, see, Destiny is all about war. God, see, Destiny is not about war." Um, and there are lots of other similar sort of answers when you read interviews from him. That like give answers that I'm like is he joking about this? Is this like a legitimate answer? Um, it's kind of hard to get a good sense of what his vision specifically for the show was because it seems to have changed. There are other things that and I will get to like the specifics. I think when we talk about the characters, but at the very least with Sheen, there's indications from Susan Muda, the the voice actor, that Sheen where Sheen ends up in the show is not exactly what he was kind of pitched for the vision of the character. Um, and there's like different things like games and manga and stuff like that that is made using some of the original like production notes early on in the development that has like really critical information some of which connected to Durandal, some of which kind of more related to Sheen that shows like differences in kind of maybe where they were going to go and then ultimately didn't work out that way um there's if there's but there's no good information on like why 
some of the things happen when they happen or something. And that's where a lot of rumors come about of like, oh, he hated this voice actor, so he made this character not as prominent. And I'm inclined to not believe those because it sounds more like fan theory bullshit. And that there's also I've sounds, no sourcing I, on any of it. And, and that doesn't sound like something that really happens in the anime industry. Exactly, that's such yeah. a petty, like, that's just not a thing that I think would happen. It's a very professionalized industry. Like, it's very yeah. mature. I, I don't think that really... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, although thinking about it being a professionalized in industry, there's one thing I did find that is like the most frank piece of like behind the scenes anything I've ever seen for one of these shows, um, which is connected to Chiaki Motosawa, the, the writer for Gundam Seed Destiny, as long as Gundam Seed, who is, who was uh, Fukuda's wife. She passed away in, in 2016. Um, but she was Fukuda's wife, um, and they worked together on most of like the major shows that Fukuda directed. Um, which again, after Seed Destiny, Fukuda doesn't work on anything again until Cross Anja, which is a show from 2014, which does not have a very good reputation. I've not personally seen it. Um, but, but they were like this kind of team working on a bunch of stuff. Um, she is, was ill around the time of Gundam Seed and Gundam Seed Destiny. She had cancer. I mean, she had like a sur surgery to take care of it, all this kind of stuff. Uh, obviously we don't know like the specific time frame of like, all, like the only thing I can find of like an interview with her is she's basically saying like around the time of working on those shows she was sick um and like dealing with that um and so I don't know like where that affects uh the production specifically of these shows but she is still the credited writer on the majority of these episodes obviously working with the writing team at Sunrise um and there's a blog post by one of the animation directors uh, that that worked on Seed Destiny, who also, he's like an old school Sunrise guy who's worked on a bunch of stuff before and since. Uh, the blog post itself doesn't exist, but there's a quote that still exists in the uh, Wikipedia for this, on in, uh, the Japanese Wikipedia for it, um, where basically he had this whole blog post that posted a couple of weeks, it was like September 2015, or 2005, before the ending of the show, just kind of putting Fukuda and Motosawa on blast, saying like, you guys are always, you're like doing all these interviews, specifically with Fukuda, like doing all these like radio interviews and things for the show. And like the scripts are way behind. When the scripts come in, they're like rough draft versions of scripts that have like vague notes or um, like lots of things are like, oh, we'll just like reuse some of this animation here and it'll be fine. And like this sort of like what seems to have been from the animation like side of it perspective, an incredibly frustrating development environment that caused like this to be dragged out. And he has, what is like, I mean, a really, really sort of stark statement um, in that is quoted here from the, this blog post where he says, and this isn't like very like that kind of rough informal Japanese. So it's like what he's saying is rude, but it's also the way he is saying it is rude, where he basically says, stop just dragging out the scenario or the story and just do your work. I mean, if you're if you can't write or you're not going to write, then just don't write. I mean, at the very least, get a clue. You're an adult after all. It's like that is a quote on the blog post. Holy shit! That again, that blog post was deleted later. Um, but that is like that is the most I have ever seen of like a because usually you get something like what we got on Gundam Wing, um, where it had a like a complicated development history and they literally switched the director mid show. And the most you get from behind the scenes is like we thought it would be like good if we went with this other director. It's like you have to really read between the lines to get a sense of like what they're trying to actually say and what went on. Um, but this animation director is like clearly did the, the, the happening like because it actually it links up pretty closely to when that uh, the mirror flashback episode happens. Yeah. I think it's it seems like it's connected probably specifically to that episode when he did it because um, I suspect that that is that episode mostly exists because they were way behind schedule. The scripts were coming in super late and they're like we just need to do a recap episode um, with when you especially consider that. You know, the timing of Final Plus, the extended ending, is such that obviously that would have been planned to have been the original ending. It is the length of exactly two episodes of a Gundam Sea Destiny. Yeah. So it like this is my my theory, but putting that together, I strongly suspect that that mere flashback episode exists entirely to pad that out, and then they just kicked off the actual ending to be this like OVA they released two months later. Yeah. Boy, uh, yeah, the, the most I've seen like something like that is you do get now on Twitter once in a while, you will get disgruntled animators. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the animators are the ones most prone to be disgruntled because they're doing a lot of very hard work. Yeah, and um, not getting very good pay for it usually. Yeah. But even, and then sometimes you will get like forum posts from animators or something, uh, but so, usually they do it anonymously, and oftentimes it's not rude, it's just frank. 
Um, and it's not as personal as that. So it's really fascinating to hear that. This, yeah. this show feels like it would have been hell to work on. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it, I'll have some other stuff I'll bring up when we yeah. get to specific sections or characters. Uh, because I do have some quotes by um, Suzumura Kenichi, the voice actor for Sheen. And then there is some stuff to talk about Kagali that we'll get to when we talk about those characters. Um, but it's, but it, yeah. it really makes sense to me. Because this show, more than just about anything I've ever watched feels like a game of Exquisite Corpse, yeah. which is the like Dadaist surrealist game where you take a piece of paper and you start a drawing and then you pass it to another artist but fold it so they can't see what came before and then they start drawing and then at the end you unfold it all and you have this horrible drawing. That's kind of what Gundam Seed Destiny feels like. Or I could just say it feels like they were making shit up as they went along. Yeah. Because getting into the body of the show, Sean, this show starts with what amounts to a four-episode filler arc. Mm -hmm. Because the beginning of this show, the, the, here's the, in a narrative sense, it's not the inciting incident, because the inciting incident is the attack on Junius 7. Yes. Or Junius 7. Do they say it with the J? Uh, I think in English you'd say it with the J. I don't remember okay. what it is. Yeah, Junius 7. They, they do that. So that's the inciting incident. But the thing that kicks the show off is Neo Roanoke and the Phantom Pain crew stealing three Gundams from um, the, the plant yeah. where Kagali and Othran have come to meet Durandal. And that this is also Sheen is on the Minerva and the Minerva is going to launch that day. And that's what kicks it off. But Phantom Pain is largely irrelevant to the plot of this show, except in a couple of points. It's relevant to the best part of the entire show, which is uh -huh. the Stella part. But like, I, I would frequently forget who they were even aligned with because it's so nebulous and weird. And it's like, uh -huh. oh, they're from Earth. It doesn't fully make sense even, but okay, they're from Earth. Um, but, but so th that's the beginning is them stealing these suits and these fights between them. And it's very much like the beginning of OG Gundam or, o or the original Gundam Seed. Just the, your basic Gundam plot setup, which is stuff's fucked. We're going to go off in our ship and try to unfuck it. Um, but then in episode five, I think it is, you get to Junius 7. Yep. And the real inciting incident, that like, because what Phantom Pain does has no actual bearing on the overall plot of the show. You could summarize the plot of the show very easily without ever mentioning Neo Roanoke and Phantom Pain. Yeah. You might have to bring in Stella because it makes Sheen angry, but you could just say an enemy pilot. You wouldn't even have to specify this whole thing about stealing the mobile suits. So you get to that, and Junior 7, it is a terrorist splinter group that is loyal to Patrick Zala. Othran's father, who was the bad guy in the one of the bad guys in the original show yeah. at Zaft. And they try to do this colony drop with Junior Seven. And then Phantom Pain just kind of fucks off. We don't even know what happens to them for a while. And then it is um, the crew of the Minerva, including Sheen and Othran, have to figure out how do we like blow up enough of this colony so there isn't damage. There is still some damage to Earth. This makes Earth angry and gives Blue Cosmos an opening to like demagogue and attack the colonies again and that starts a new war. And the thing is, if episode like five or something was like the beginning of the show, if the show started with the Sheen flashback, the beginning of the show, which I think is a very good opening, yeah. and then you cut to five years later or whatever and Sheen is on the Minerva as they're like patrolling space and then something happens with Junior Seven, it's a really good plot setup because it is like this... And it feels like a direct... I did a whole Twitter thread about this. It feels like a direct 9-11 Iraq war parable where it is a non-national terrorist group that does not belong to a nation does a terrorist attack and then the nation that is attacked uses that to demagogue an entire ethnic group, which in this case is the coordinators, and launches a war on them, which is like what we did fighting Iraq, which did nothing to yeah. us. Which is also what the setup for Gundam Seed is also. Yes. <laughs> and this is something that we'll say a lot probably in Gundam Seed Destiny is like, a lot of Gundam Seed Destiny is kind of doing the same thing that Gundam Seed did, slightly different and slightly worse. Yeah. Or Although the thing worse. is, in Gundam Seed, and I think this is one of my complaints, is that a lot of that is oblique backstory that you sure. get in a recap episode. But anyway, it because actually I think these episodes that I'm describing are pretty good. Like, the sure, action yeah. is good. There's, it's very high tension. There's all these political maneuverings. It kind of feels like the movement from Gundam to Zeta in the same way where, like, politics becomes much more forward and there's a lot more factions going on. But throughout this whole thing, I'm watching this so confused because I'm like, but what about those first four episodes and these Phantom Pain guys who now are just gone and like don't reappear until like episode 15 or something. Mm -hmm. 
So it's got this, and then like you're off to the races eventually with this war, but then a bunch of other stuff happens, and like it's easy, and then like the entire Iraq War metaphor just completely flips by the end of the show, and Durandal becomes like the George Bush. It is so bizarre. It is yeah. so bizarre. Yeah. So I think in talking about the show, I think kind of like the first way we have to approach it is to recognize that I think fundamentally at its core. Gundam Seed Destiny is trying to be two different TV shows that are contradictory at the same time. It is <laughs> You're both, so right, but yeah. it's such a funny thing to say. It is both trying to be Gundam Seed Zeta, right? Which is what you're kind of saying here about, like, it wants to be a little bit more politically minded. It wants to do the thing of, let's bring back some of the older characters, but have this new protagonist be one who's, like, reflecting on them more critically and trying to, like, push them to change and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and Zeta Gundam is, is one of the best sequels to anything ever. And, like, one of the things it does that's so successful, the thing Sea Destiny tries to vaguely imitate, is um, it, it takes this very, like, incisive, critical, reflective look back on the content of the original show, those characters, the themes, the politics, all of that, and tries to complicate them, modernize them, push them forward, all that kind of stuff. Um, one obviously huge difference between that situation for the original Gundam to Zeta and Seed and Seed Destiny is that the original Gundam and Zeta Gundam are separated by like seven years in production. And Tomino made other shows and grew as an artist and yeah. all sorts of things. Yeah, lots of like time moved on in the real world and then also in the setting of the sequel, which I think is also super important to doing that kind of story. With Seed and Seed Destiny, it is set two years later, right? So mm -hmm. it's like the returning characters, Kida and Athan and Lakis and Kagali, are all 18 now instead of 15 or 16. There's no old. change in their character designs yeah. other than some clothing. Um, and so the political scenario doesn't feel like it should have shifted that much realistically in those two years. Um, and then like Sheen is too similar in like age and experience and stuff like that to Kida. Um, and the rest of the old crew. And so it's like, it's got some like things where it's trying to ape some of that setup, but it can't quite really do it because it is also trying to be Gundam Seed 2, like where Kida and buddies, and for like the first half of the show, it's more like Othran, and then the second half, like inexplicably Kida. They, they keep on saying, I have so many interviews where Fukuda talks about Kida being the protagonist of Sea Destiny by the end. And I'm like, I don't know how you can possibly look at Kida as being a protagonist because he has no fucking character arc. Um, but the concept for the show is that it has three protagonists. It's supposed to have Sheen, Othran, and Kida as protagonists. For the first half, it's more Othran and his like returning adventures of Othran um, and kind of redoing basically his character arc from Gundam Seed. Only the rest of the show is not set up to do that character arc, so it's really poorly done. Um, and then having Kida and Lacus and everybody just go on another big, crazy adventure. Um, and that's where a lot of the show's instincts about trying to replicate things that the first show did, only slightly different. Um, I think that's where that comes from. And like having Durandal be a villain who embodies and literalizes a lot of the subtextual themes of Gundam Seed about like distrust and power and um, like trying to avoid being in a situation where a large system of power controls you and manipulates you and determines for you what like is and is not possible and what you can and cannot do, which is what Gundam Seed is about. But it's about that in like a realistic way and not in this like ridiculous, here is a mastermind who's literally sitting at a chessboard and moving everything and manipulating the whole scenario and we have to defeat him, not the systems of power, but this one person who is creating the scenario that controls everything. Um, and so it's both trying to be Let's do everything again, but more obvious and slightly dumber. Um, but and The like, Die Hard 2 approach. Yes, the Die Hard 2 ap approach. Or let's be this like radical, interesting sequel that critically analyzes a lot of the elements from the first series and sort of does something new with them. Those are two shows that cannot coexist. And yet, that is what Sea Destiny is always doing. And the thing that's most frustrating about it is that when I was talking about it, when it comes to two paths, heaven and hell... Heaven is vaguely like the Seed Zeta direction, which is the way more interesting show. And it always veers yes. towards Gundam Seed 2 and sort of defers to that version of the show to the extent where Sheen, at the end, he's like not even like the third wheel in the protagonist. He's like become the fourth wheel or something. Like Lacus feels like he asc she ascends above Sheen and like the protagonist hierarchy um, in a way that just the show just sort of like falls apart by the end because it cannot sustain this incredible contradiction at its core. Because Kira and Sheen are fundamentally incompatible as co-protagonists. Yes. I do think they're compatible in the like Amuro, 
uh, Camille setup or something like that, oh, yeah. or or more more accurately, even the Amaro um, Char uh, Quattro Bagina setup or uh-huh. something like that, uh, or even what I would like is a, a protagonist antagonist setup, and we'll talk about that later because Kira is the villain of this show. Yeah, and honestly, um, I think maybe it ultimately is supposed to be a protagonist antagonist setup, but with Kira as the protagonist and she yes. becomes an antagonist, maybe is what yeah. he was going for. But I don't know because yeah, because these two are incompatible because the Zeta approach relies on. The character, the Camille archetype, let's call it, yeah. being angrier, darker, and a little rougher, but also having a better understanding of the current moment because he is younger and doesn't have his like vision clouded by past conflict. Yeah. And so he has a different view that makes the returning characters reevaluate themselves, and he sees them through a new set of eyes that is given to the audience because he is... From moment one, the POV of that show. Yeah. And he is strictly... You have a lot of stuff with Char, and you have a lot of stuff with other characters, but Camille is the vision through which the show is filtered. Yeah, and he is, like, unambiguously the protagonist, capital P protagonist of Zeta Gundam. Yeah, Yeah. no doubt about it. In this show, like, Sheen is in that first scene, and then he isn't in the first episode again until he comes in in the Gundam at the very end. Yeah. And it becomes this thing where the vision really is going back and forth and it cannot decide on a POV. But to have a POV where Kira returns as the active protagonist, you cannot also have a POV where you have someone new with a better understanding of the current situation who is critical of Kira because those two things literally cannot coexist. And so you either have to decide the Camille path of, well, maybe Kira is wrong and needs to be changed which is what Sheen would be, or be defeated or killed because he is a fucking menace in this show. Or you have Kira who is, who becomes literally godlike and omnipotent. Yes, this is where, uh, we talked about this on Gundam Seed, but Kira has a very beloved uh, nickname in the English Seed community, which is Jesus Yamato. And that is for this show. (laughs) Yes. Or he becomes Jesus Yamato who is right in all things and knows all things. And therefore, Sheen has to be wrong in all things, even though, because enough of the show is Zeta-influenced, Sheen is not wrong in all things, but the show has to make him wrong in all things. And this is where we get the, this is the most frustrating show yeah, ever made. It's this where, like, you get angry watching the show. It's like, there's, I feel like it's not possible to, like, actively watch see Destiny with, like, like a critical lens, which is obviously how we try to watch shows for this podcast. Uh, because it would be a very boring podcast if we just said, that was cool when the robot did the cool thing. Uh, but if you're, like, <laughs> really trying to, like, think about what is the show doing, what is it trying to say, all that kind of stuff, it's just, like, it's impossible to make any meaning out of it. Because it is constantly having to come up with bizarre, contrived ways for both characters, Kira um, and Sheen, and then Othran is just sort of, like, stuck in the middle with, I think, no clear vision on what that character is supposed to be doing no. in the show at all. Um that, like, it is trying to make both of them protagonists, neither of them protagonists, and it's just, like, you can't, you can't, like, square that circle, right? It's just, like, it doesn't make sense, and it's so frustrating, and so the show has to, contri- like, contrive bizarre things um, to make everything fit together. Um, and the main tool through which that happens is uh, Durandal, the chairman of the plants, which I think we kind of need to talk about his role in the plot and everything with Gundam Seed, maybe for any other character for Sea Destiny. Yeah, I mean, I will say my thesis that I said on Twitter a little bit before I finished the show, but I still believe this, is pretty much all problems in Gundam Seed Destiny can be traced to an axis of Kira and Durandal and how they treat those two characters is kind of my overall belief because uh-huh. I think it's the fucking up of both of them that dooms everything. And Durandal, I... So here's the thing, Sean. Yeah. I tweeted a lot about Gundam Seed. And that became a part of our podcast when we talked about it, of me, I was kind of working through my feelings in real time, and I, I really didn't like it at first, and I should have just held off and waited. And so I made a resolution that you probably heard on this podcast uh-huh. in the last episode, I'm like, I'm going to tweet less about Destiny. Well, that became impossible, because that's kind of how I, like, think out loud, uh-huh. and I was trying to process my feelings, and I really needed to try processing my feelings on Gundam Seed, Destiny. And so I had quite a few threads on Durandal. Because they did something so crazy with this character. I have so many thoughts. And some of it comes down to... they. I think they used Shuichi Ikeda wrong. And it hurts me to say that. Because I love Shuichi Ikeda. And I kind of love him in this. But I also think they used him wrong. Yeah. I mean, like with most things in Seed Destiny, there is a really fascinating kernel to Durandal. Yes. Um, 
and 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 he needs to be for I think for that colonel, you need to kind of see the show from the Kira side, the Gundam C two side. That like there is an interesting concept with him as a villain, which is to have him be this character who is manipulating everything behind the scenes, right? Like outside of like the scenes where Sheen is with him, right? Like the stuff where you just kind of cut to him. He's always sitting at a fucking chessboard with his chess pieces in a dark room and like muttering like ominous shit to himself. So it's like he's, he's even when for most of the show, I mean, almost the entire show, you have no idea what he's scheming, why he's scheming it, anything like that. He almost never does anything yeah. outwardly villainous, which is a big problem. Yeah. I'll talk about that. Yeah, but like the what they're you, but you're keyed in for the show that he is. He is this mastermind type villain because he has his chessboard. It's like, and he's voiced by Shuji Keda, so you immediately associate him as like, oh, he's some villain type character. He is a char. Yeah, he is. He is a char in the in the words of a great uh, letter in the history of the annals of Gundam. He is a char, um, and. The, the concept of him, if they had executed him well within that framework of he is a character who is trying to sort of literalize some of the things that were subtextual in the first show um, and embody that quality of he is manipulating things. He is like the, that system of power made flesh trying to move th these pieces on this chessboard to create the scenario he needs for his destiny plan, which is like the ultimate realization of this sense of control in society. Um, he does this by um, taking the Gundam boy and through subtle machinations that are very Palpatine-esque. And I think it's important that this didn't come out post Revenge of the Sith, but it is post Attack of the Clones. And I think there's a very clear Anakin Palpatine thing that they were going for. Um, that's not just me saying that. That is like voice actors working on the show being like, uh, he was kind of very Anakin Skywalker-y, huh? Yeah, I think yeah. We kind of, it kind of ended up like that. Um, but him having this Palpatine relationship with someone who's supposed to be the Gundam boy and doing these little things to sort of ultimately make the Gundam boy villainous, turn him into his, like, Durandal's Kita Yamato. Um, and that's his, like, plan in, in instigating this destiny thing. But his fatal flaw being that he's trying to be so controlling that every time he tries to create this perfect scenario, it ends up creating the means by which he's ultimately defeated. The only reason why Kira and Lacus ever get involved, this is fucking contrived and stupid, the only reason they ever get involved is because he sends the assassination plot for Lacus in the first place. That had not happened. Nothing in the show indicates that Kira ever would have moved from that stupid fucking beach and him staring off into the horizon being like, a, why, are, why are things bad still? Why, is, why are bad things happening? Um, and it's only because they are directly threatened that he comes in, right? The only reason why Othran ultimately goes to the Archangel is because Durandal doesn't like that Othran's not going to be his perfect puppet, so Durandal just tries to have him fucking killed. And that's like he's trying to be so controlling that it ultimately things spiral out of control, and it, it is his downfall. And conceptually, if that was executed well, that'd be a great fucking villain. The problem is, that is not executed well, because half of the show you're seeing it from this opposite lens, where he doesn't feel like he's supposed to be a villain. Yeah, and here's the thing. I I I hadn't thought of it through the way you're saying it, and I don't disagree with anything you're saying. Yeah. But my perspective was totally different, which was I was seeing it more from the... That's more of like the Gundam Seed 2 perspective. Yes. Which, from, like I said earlier, uh, I had to watch it from that perspective on a rewatch because right. you it is so hard to see the show from the other viewpoint when you know the show yes. is ultimately not going to be invested in it. And I was really cued into the Mobile Suit Seed Zeta uh, or Mobile Suit Zeta Seed, I don't know yeah. what you'd call it, uh, perspective that is more Sheen-centric because I find Sheen a really fascinating and compelling character. And the thing is, from the Sheen perspective, where I see... Kira as kind of a villain, not just kind of, he is an absolutely a villain doing horrible things in this show, and, and him thinking he is absolutely right makes everything worse. I see Durandal and like his ultimate villainy as a mirror of Kira. Mm -hmm. And what I see him as is Durandal is someone, he and Kira nominally have the same goal, which is to eliminate war and create permanent peace. Right. And they both think they are absolutely right, and are the only ones who are right. And anyone who is different is is so inherently wrong. And like Kira has this absolutist belief in this show that fighting is always bad. And that therefore he has the right to fight and kill to stop fighting. And he has more power than nation states or elected leaders or anyone else to decide that. And Durandal has also taken the position because he says this over and over again and it turns out he is honest. He does want to stop war. 
That is the point of the destiny plan, is to make life predictable and eliminate conflict. And what Durandal wants is the nth degree version of what Kira is advocating. And so Durandal really is the evil mirror of Kira who has taken Kira's philosophy to the next level. And to me, the right version of this show would be a turning point around two-thirds of the way through, where instead of taking the path to hell where you view Kira as godly, you take the path to heaven where Sheen somehow gets through to Kira and gets him to realize my point of view is valid, and Kira recognizes himself in Durandal when the destiny plan starts and says, shit, that's the path I was going down. We need to figure something out here and comes back to the light in that way, because that is what Durandal is. And so there is this super hackneyed thing in the final three episodes when, and it's so funny, they only actually tell you what the Destiny plan is in the final three episodes. Yeah, it's so bad. And Kira and Locus start having this conversation. And I did, I tweeted this, because I took screenshots of this. I, I'm going to look them up right now really quick um, to see the, the dialogue. But, but Kira is like, I hate this plan, but I really want to put an end to war. And I lean forward in my chair and I'm like, oh my god, he almost, he's almost getting it. He almost gets it. And then Laka says, right now we have no choice but to fight. All lives are meant to fight for a desired future. As living beings, we much fight that which seeks to destroy us. And I'm like, oh my god, you guys almost get it. You almost get what this show is secretly about. And then they're like, yes, we gotta kill that guy. And I'm like, you fucking idiots. You came so close to seeing what this show is actually about and you let it go because what they do is they just reset it as like, well, he's the bad guy, so we got to fight him so we can stop the fighting instead of them realizing, oh, fuck, we did everything wrong. We're just like him because that's what the show is about, but it doesn't know it. See, but like what the show wants to be about is exactly what Laka says there, which is we need, because Kita's... Because I definitely see where you're coming from. I think, again, I think on my first view, like, watching of the show, I would have been like, yes, because I was way more on Sheen's side. Watching it the second time, it's like, that is such a desperate fantasy <laughs> for the show to reach for. Because because it would contradict too much of, like, what the show is, like, intentionally trying to say. Um, I don't know if we'd be able to do it from that perspective. Because what the show wants Kida to represent is an extension of him from Gundam Seed. And... They do not. They do not do this well <laughs> at all. But the the concept is that he is about freedom, right? He is about. It's not about being uh, controlled. It's the opposite of that. That like humans need the freedom to live as um like in, in this belief that if you give them ultimate freedom, that ultimately we can reach this Amuro esque vision of like with this hope in humanity that eventually war will go away from that perspective. But you also need to fight in order to create freedom for people right but it's his just, freedom is oppressive that's my yeah. problem is that i agree and i see that but his freedom is oppressive it gets people killed it it ruins and makes the situation worse at every turn he fucking shows up he makes things actively worse except for if he didn't durandal would execute his destiny plan and everyone would be fucked for all time right? but they kind of want the same thing because his ultimate freedom you're deciding you're describing is one in which kira gets to decide what is freedom and it's ultimately him because he's the one who's saying, be free or I will shoot you. And Durandal is saying, don't do war because I will put something in your brain. We actually never learned what the destiny plan actually is. I, I mean, it's, I yeah, it's going to be basically like, I'm going to control everything about your lives. And you like, you will work in the job yeah. that I decide you work in and marry the people I decide you marry and have the children I decide you, you have children of but and like so forth. it's it's kind of like on the political spectrum in like the history of the of the of the 1900s right where you have dictators who are far left communist and dictators who are far right fascists and at a certain point that line just becomes a circle and it's like this is just different forms of oppression at the same point that's my point about kira and durandal and it is a it is a duality the show is fundamentally incapable of recognizing, but some come so close to accidentally writing themselves into it. Sure, yeah. I think I can kind of see that. Um, yeah, it's. I think the problem with Durandal is that they don't, they, they're so precious about the fucking Destiny Plan shit that they wait so long to commit to that character um, that, I mean, because really, like, what Durandal does... He is responsible, one, for Phantom Pain, like all the Phantom Pain stuff, secretly he is, is responsible for. Wait, how? Um, so he's is, to, to this, this is all information the show is very bad at expressing. Some of this is stuff that on a second rewatch is a little bit more clear, 
this is also like in interviews and stuff like Fukuda has basically just like said all this I'm like okay I guess this is supposed to be what that was like vaguely implying in this one shot um but you know that he is effectively in league with Logos to some degree it's not really clear Wait, how he, much how I don't get any of he this. has access to the destroy Gundam plans which is the fake psycho Gundam before we ever see it we see him like watching that on a screen shortly oh. before he get uh Sheen gives Stella back to Phantom Pain so for the plot of Gundam Seed Destiny to function, Durandal has to have manipulated everything that has happened. The Junius 7 drop, that was him. They Van never say that. They never fucking say that. They what never say that, but it is him. And there is a shot here. Well, If they don't say it, then it's like, I, I understand, but yeah, like... No, I, but I want to... Here's where the show is fucked. So uh, in an interview that uh, Fugita gave, and this was around the time, this was a little bit after Destiny uh, finished airing, um, they basically, the interviewers ask him, I mean, they're like, like, there's like Otaku. I think one of like Tanaka BA, the voice actress is in here. And then like one other person is sort of like a fan. Um, and they have all these questions from fans. One of which is basically like, how much was Durandal's plot? Like, what was the extent of his plot? Was he the one who caused the Unia 7 thing to happen? Because nothing, because the Destiny plan could never have happened if the Unia 7 drop does not occur. Like that is like essential for everything to go into place. Durndal has created the Destiny plan well before the events of Sea Destiny happen. We learn that because Kira finds the plans, right? So it's like, it's vaguely implied in that sense that for anything to have happened, that well, poly drop has thing. to have occurred. Uh, okay, and I get that. And I was, uh, sorry, I have a yeah. confession to make. Okay. I have a confession to make. While I was watching the final plus episode, the 51, yeah. I got so frustrated in the middle of it that I paused it and started writing my own fanfic rewrite of Gundam Sea okay. Destiny. And it starts with changing the beginning so that Phantom Pain is pretending to be a splinter group, but is just, and we find out like in the first episode, just working for Durandal, and yeah. they steal the, the suits, and then they go do the colony drop just to smooth out those first ten episodes. That's basically what the show wants to have happened, but it's too precious about it to actually say anything. Because about. I was waiting the entire, because my assumption was... He's voiced by Shuichi Ikeda. He's a duplicitous motherfucker. Yeah. We're going to find out that he is two-faced and he ordered the colony drop. They never reveal that. And and I have a fundamental belief that if it's said in an interview but not in the show, it doesn't count. But here's <laughs> where in the interview he, he basically says, it's like, yes, he was responsible for the Unia 7 drop. And because they also never actually explicitly say that he is also the one responsible for sending the assassins to kill Lachis, which yeah. always feels like something that should be... Like, obviously, that's what happened. But it feels like something the show should, right. like, actually say at some point. Well, and um, we'll get to, I, I have a whole point about Durandal I want to make in a second. But yeah, yes. but uh, in the interview, he basically says, it's like, yeah, if you watch the episode, it's like episode 7 or whatever, when when the when Union 7 gets split in half, there's a brief shot to him, and, and he looks disappointed or whatever. And and that's your clue. And, and I looked back at him like, that's technically true. Uh, but that is a very roundabout way. Like, the, in he, the moment, it does not... Even having watched the show, show a second time, and me knowing that it's supposed to be him. Like, I remember that. That it is supposed to be him. Because that's also something that, like, in games, in manga, that are based on some of the original production notes, makes that absolutely explicit that it was Durandal who planned it. So it's like, that was the intention. It's But, it, like, watching it okay. with that in mind, it's impossible to get that from that scene. So, okay. Yeah. My rant. Okay. Here's the problem. With the actual text of the show, yes. where, as you say, it is impossible to get these things, Durandal does not do anything concretely wrong yeah. until the final episodes of the show. Uh huh. The problem is... So, so, okay, backing up. One of the things we praised Gundam Seed about, the original Seed, is that while it plays on some ideas from other Gundam shows and obviously borrows designs and all sorts of things and, and the plot for the first half... Um, it is clearly a Gundam aimed at a new generation of fans. Yeah. And that's one of the fascinating things about it is it is not pitched at people who have a pre-existing relationship with Gundam, which all the other Gundams to some degree are. Mm -hmm. Some less, like like it's tenuous with like Mobile Fighter G Gundam, but the attraction is seeing all these... Like it's still there, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, something like After War Gundam X, it's really heavily there. Yeah, it's almost like necessary for yes. you to really watch the show. Yeah. And then Gundam Seed is, is different, and that's a refreshing, interesting thing about it. The problem is, the only real textual way you have of knowing Durandal is supposed to be the bad guy is that you have seen Mobile Suit Gundam, yeah. and you know Shuichi Ikeda doing that voice. Because Shuichi Ikeda can do lots of voices, and he can do voices where you do not suspect someone of wrongdoing, but they are directing him to do his Shara's novel voice. Yeah. 
and he is doing his Shara's novel voice. And when you hear that, as a Gundam fan of 30 years at this point, you know he is a Shar. He must be duplicitous. Therefore, I cannot trust him. But that is actually not a textual thing. That is an extra textual thing. And in the text of the show, what happens is a random terrorist splinter group drops a colony and then tries to new and then Earth, in response, goes fucking nuts and tries to commit genocide against Zaft by nuking all colonies out of existence, which Durandal stops, and then Durandal is fighting back in what is very clearly a righteous cause. And if he does some kind of weird things, like having his propaganda locus, the other people tried to commit genocide. And so the whole show is Kira saying, ignore the Hitler guys. Yeah. Something's off about this Durandal. Yeah. Even though, from the actual evidence we have, he's done nothing. And the only reason for you to suspect him is either you know Shara's novel... Or you are literal omnipotent Jesus Yamato and therefore can identify with Spidey sense who is good and who is bad. And that is the thing that more than anything I think drew me, drove me crazy over the course of this show. Because they are not actually giving you textual indications of him being a villain. They're giving you either extra textual or setting it up to make Kira look smart down the line. By letting him predict something he would have no textual, diegetic way of predicting. Yeah. And that is the problem with Chairman Durandal. Yeah, no, they, they, they are so precious about their, like, twist. They want him yeah. to be the master m manipulator behind the scenes. But you need, you need to give the audience, like, an indication that that's happening. That is more than him looking at a chessboard, right? Yes. Like, that's, that is the main real indication the show gives you is that he's, he looks at a chessboard. Yeah. And it's, like, shorthand for he is some sort of manipulative genius. But you need to, you need to tip your hand. And the most it does, up, like, before the Destiny Gundam thing, is there is literally one shot in the episode before the Stella Psycho Gundam stuff happens, where he's looking at a screen that has plans for the their version of the Psycho Gundam, which is something you wouldn't know what the fuck that means if you didn't already watch the show and know, oh, that's their version of the Psycho yeah. Gundam. There's no way he would know about it, which is obviously why you it would have not registered as anything to you, because you had no context for what that might mean. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's madness. I think there's a reason why... Shuichi Ikeda has never been cast as a non-Shar character in Gundam. His, his legacy within Gundam is too big. Mm -hmm. He can't go voice another character. I love Shuichi Ikeda. In the context of Gundam, it is like perverse to have him voice someone else. Because either it will unfairly like color things. And maybe like maybe he's playing a good guy but it unfairly colors things. Or it will be like this, where it becomes a crutch for the writing team yeah. that allows them to be too precious by, not half, but 700 times. Um, and so, like, I, I think Shuichi Ikeda is just off limits to Gundam if he's not voicing Char. And I hate to say that, but it's like, yeah, I think I'm right. No, I yeah, I agree. I just think it's like, and he gives a fucking great performance as Durandal. Like, He's phenomenal. Every, but... every scene the character's in, I just, like, I, I, I really enjoy the character. I enjoy the concept of the character um, in, like, in the vision of, like, either version of, like, a potentially good seed Destiny. There's, like, a version of this character that is interesting. But he is, he is, he and Kida are, like, the two, I think, cruxes upon which this show just, like, breaks its own fucking back, basically. Yes. Because it's just, like, it can't figure out what to do with him and do, because, because those are, him and Kida are the two characters that most exist, like, on the in the middle of, like, whatever this, like, dynamic of the shows is trying to create are. Like, they right. don't fit neatly into either vision of what the show is trying to do. And so it's like both of them they just... They could go either way at any point. Yeah, and yeah. so both of them just feel like like non-characters at some point that are just, like, plot devices effectively to get things to occur, whether there's logic or meaning behind those things occurring in the first place. Yeah, and it, and it leads to stuff like, when I talk about infuriating... The most infuriating thing in the history of Gundam to me, and maybe ever watching fucking television, fictional television, is like, it's it's the big orb attack near the end of like the third core. Uh-huh. Where, um, so orb, which at this point has aligned itself with Earth, is harboring Jibril, who is yeah. the head of Logos, and is basically at this point space Hitler, because he is bent on killing every single coordinator 
in the cosmos. Which also makes no sense with the show's conception of what Logos is supposed to be. That he is like... Right. Like, they're supposed to be the perpetual military-industrial complex, and yet the only thing you see anyone motivated by is, like, the same bigotry from the first show. It's like, that's not the same thing. What do you... It's... Yeah, everything, yeah. everything about Seed Destiny is terrible. Yes. But it's anyway, piss me off. J Jabril is being harbored by Orb. And so Durandal, who again at this point, I'm pretty fucking sure is going to turn out to be the villain, but he still hasn't done anything outwardly villainous, is ordering them, go get Jabril because he wants to genocide us. Yeah. And so Sheen and the crew of the Minerva start attacking Orb. Now, should they have done something a little different instead of just like carpet bombing Orb? Probably. So not the best solution. But this is sort of like a... Pakistan harboring Osama bin Laden situation, the answer is not just let him stay there. Mm -hmm. The answer is do fucking something. And it's not just Pakistan harboring Osama bin Laden. It's like if Pakistan were harboring him the day after 9-11 while he was actively planning another 9-11. Mm -hmm. And then if we were like, and then if there was some guy in a mobile suit who came over and was like, no, 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 you cannot take Osama bin Laden. Just fucking leave him there. I was like, no, that's crazy. And that's what Kira wants. It's like, just stop attacking Orb. There's nothing. Just let them have Jabril. And in Kira's fucking uh, manipulations here and interfering with the battle, he lets Jabril get away. And then what does Jabril do? He goes and fires a giant space laser and kills tens of millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions. How many people live in the plants? I'm not sure. But it is a genocide level event that he causes because Kira is more concerned with his vague fears about this Jabril guy than he is with the concrete immediate danger of space Hitler getting away and firing a giant space laser. That is, that is like the defining moment of Seed Destiny to yeah. me, of fucking everything up. And here's the, here's the craziest part of all of it. That basically needs to happen for Durandal to get his destiny plan to yeah. happen. Because it's like, that is the last thing of like, now we have had the two great, like, mass loss of lives on both sides, the Genius 7 drop on Earth, and then the attack on the colonies after this prolonged war where Zaft has created good public relations with a lot of the different countries on Earth. Um, and now we need, like, all the plant people to be totally on our side. So let's have the Earth people fire the space laser, and it's just like, the the crazy like chess thing he's doing it's like he's very good at chess if somehow he has manipulated the scenario to get that to happen it doesn't make any fucking sense um he's gonna be a guest star on the next season of the queen's gambit he's exactly so good at this it is yes and it is infuriating because and like ultimately what the show does I, th I think it makes every character seem like a fucking idiot they all have caused massive loss of life life because they're an idiot um and it's just like Especially on a second watch, you just like despise every character by the end. Like it's yeah. just every character is just like I just hate everybody. I hate all of you, and I hate the show most of all just for like taking a lot of these of their characters that I love. And luckily, like watching Gundam Seed, having seen Seed Destiny, it did not affect my enjoyment of that original show because I think Gundam Seed holds up really well on its own. Fuck everything that happens in Seed Destiny, but it takes those characters that I love and makes them fucking fucking morons they're stupid idiots or that are useless morons. dumb fucking idiots yes Athrin really gets dumbified yeah Kogali Lacus Kira is, is meant to be smart in the context of the show but is really a big old dum dum yes yeah and and no it's yeah and like at that point you're talking about stuff Durandal couldn't possibly plan yes it's because, really absurd because it relies on Kira having been activated, which he didn't want because Kira is ultimately his downfall, but Kira is also necessary to fuck with things enough that Jabril gets away yeah. and is off scot-free to go fire his space laser, which he needs to happen. Yeah, it is It is bad. Also, the show has a casualness about mass loss of life yeah. that is super disturbing from this franchise because usually, like, I don't know, look, look, look at the colony drop on Dublin in Double Zeta Gundam. Uh -huh. What doesn't happen is it happens and they're like... Okay, and then they go do something else. That's what happens when like half of the plants are blown up in this. Yeah. It's like Kira does it. There's not even a scene of Kira reacting to half of my people are dead. Yeah, no, it's it's something that it's like a way more extreme version of something that Gundam Wing did that we talked about that podcast yeah. where Gundam Wing at a certain point it has um, Quattro Barbara Wiener um, blow up like a whole space colony or whatever, and it's not clear. Was that a populated space colony? Was it not populated? It's like, did like millions, tens of millions of people just get killed? I have no idea. Um, and then they like, if it, then it's that tendency of like getting them to just sort of eventually start to ignore mass loss of life and then also to ignore like when the mobile suits get shot down, the people blow up too, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And then like losing some of those cutaways. 
all that. Yeah, it is. It has a very, let's say, blasé attitude towards like the politics that it presents. Um, like Gundam Seed Destiny's like whole political framework. Like it, it's that thing where it's like it has interesting notions where you can see, oh, if you gave a shit about the politics of the show and committed to a direction, there's like interesting stuff there. But it, it self-contradicts its own politics constantly because the politics of the show are another tool to be manipulated to get whatever like weird plot thing you want to occur to occur rather than it being a natural thing that the show is exploring some vision of what the world is. Um, and it's all of all of those elements are wrapped up in that, that it, it is trying to express multiple things that are contradictory at the same time and it cannot do it and it is blowing up your mind while you're watching the show. That's a good way of saying it. Okay, where else, what, so we talked about Durandal. Where we're going on. Yeah. I mean, this it's, is not a show we are going to go linearly through. No, yeah, I don't think it's worth, like, trying to go... We'll, like, talk about some of the major plot arcs, but I think it's probably most worthwhile to just, like, kind of go character by character in yeah. where that takes us, because yeah. I feel like that's, like, the only way you can kind of think about the show. So we did Durandal. What character do you want to do a deep I mean, do you on? just want to do Kira? Because we said that's the yeah. axis on which the okay, show's yeah. back breaks. Let's, let's do Kira. So originally for me one of my greatest frustrations the first time i watched it was this feeling of just a complete betrayal of like the core of kita and Lachis. because we might as well attack tackle Lachis at the same time yeah she can come with them fuck yeah. her up so bad um but they 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 betray what those characters are to me like at their core immediately at the very beginning of the show when the show's notion of what Kira has been doing in the two years, it's only been two years. This isn't like he's had lived a whole life and like lost his great love or whatever, you know? It's not Amro who has been like stuck on earth with like the trauma of the war and the loss of La Lassoon and like the government literally like imprisoning him in a mansion or as secretly. A, or like Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi. Yes. Who, had, who has become like a misanthrope but lived a full life of 30 years where he tried to do lots of what we would expect Luke Skywalker to try. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it's two years, right? He went from being a sophomore in high school to a senior in high school. It's yeah. not a big difference in time. What has he spent those two years since the end of Gundam Seed? A show that was all about him um, sort of like awakening to the realities of like the world and that his own capabilities and this belief that like he needs to struggle and fight in order to create the world that he wants to live in, that he thinks is the best world. Um, and that it's like, that's something that's worth fighting for and not what other people tell him to fight for, but his own beliefs. And he wins that through like loss and blood and tears. He loses so many people and suffers so much by the end of that show. What has he done in the two years since? Jack fucking shit. He has done zero to try to present, to prevent the exact situation of what has just happened. He has gone to go rave, raise orphans on some random fucking island in the middle of nowhere with Lachis and that reverend from the first show. Um, and he's just, that's it. That's what he's been doing for two years with Lachis. Not doing anything of trying to create and sustain the peace that he fought so hard for, but just watch it on a beach as everything burns around him and just go, oh, this is weird. Well, why are bad things happening? Why are bad things happening again? Oh, oh no. And it's just like, why are bad things happening? Because you never did one fucking thing to try to stop them, you fucking idiot. What is happening? Like, that conception that that is what Kira does in between the two shows, just, it is it is impossible for me to conceive of that that's the character from the first show would do that. And immediately, we make the Jesus Yamato joke, but they code him as a god in yes. this show. He is a divine being, and at the beginning, he is a benevolent hands-off divine being who is literally coded as watching his creation he is standing on the beach watching the ocean which is empty by the way yeah. so it's it's implying that he can like he has beyond sight and he is like seeing the world from his from his domain and he is he is fucking king kai yeah. up on his planet watching earth they should have given him a little car to drive around in and a, and a fucking monkey because that's what he's except king kai is fun yeah. um kira is not fun not um, on this show, no. No. He's not fun in the other show sure, either. Yeah, but, but he's yeah. he's a fun character to watch in the first show. Sure. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so he is a divine being who at a certain point in the show, basically after the Locus assassination incident, decides, 
fuck these little humans, they have messed up too much, now I am a non-benevolent god, and I will wreak some Old Testament wrath on these motherfuckers. And that's what he decides, and he becomes the god who comes down and intervenes. Um, I mean, almost in like a Greek god sense at a certain point, right? Like, like you let the humans alone for a little while, then it's like, that Odysseus ate my calves, I'm gonna go fuck him up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what he like decides. And so he is coded as divine from moment one, to the end, like to, literally, to the end where he is the character inexplicably that has the last scene with fucking Durandal, right? Like yeah. it is, it is absurd. And and yeah. like if you go with the extended ending, he's the one who has to like offer Shin his hand and like is the redeemer of Shin. Yeah, he is. He is like Shin is coming and like kissing the ring of Jesus Yamato. Yamato yeah. Um, and and that is just and that is the framing. Like this show, this is basically what people wanted Luke Skywalker to be in the Last Jedi, right? Uh -huh, yeah, divine, all-knowing Jesus who will like if you thought Kira was cool in the last show, you will be rewarded because we made him the divine being who knows all and sees all. And it is above all else just the most patronizing, shitty fan service because yeah. no one actually wanted that. Yeah, no, it's it's. It's so frustrating because it's this thing where, because they frame him that way, one, it makes him this, like, hypocritical, frustrating, annoying, stupid piece of shit, um, which is, like, not the character I feel like we had from the first show. Like, he has those elements, but you see him grow past a lot yeah. of that shit by the end. And it's like, he's a character that, in my feelings on Gundam Seed, again, this is something I just remember so just like in my gut despising about Seed Destiny as soon as I realized that's what it was doing. It was like, to me, he is a character that would do everything in his power to try to maintain the peace once the war is over. Like that's what he has won at the end of that war is yeah. that. And I feel like that's who that character would be. Like Othran is not super active at the beginning of the show, but at least what he's doing is staying by Kogali because yeah. he believes she is the leader who will help bring about peace and he's staying by her. That's the kind of thing Kira would do. Yeah, he would find wherever he can leverage his influence and do that is where it feels like that character should be headed. But they instead do this weird, like, as you say, like, like divine thing to the character and make him feel like he is supposed to be perfect even though you see this like no he's definitely very much not perfect um and he's just constantly sort of standing around f saying like vague fucking fortune cookie sayings about yep. like we just have to believe in each other and freedom and and it's like i don't know why the bad things are happening but if we believe hard enough and we fight hard enough we can stop them i promise if you all clap your hands tinkerbell will come back yeah. to life and, and it's one of the main problems with that is that especially when in the second half of the show um, where he gets more and more and more screen time until he, according to the director of the show, becomes the protagonist, he has no character arc. Like, he doesn't change. Like, nothing shifts for him. Like, it's he is just this static nothing character um, until eventually, like, he just somehow takes over the entire show to the point where, and I did not realize this until uh, I was researching some of this stuff, for episodes 1 through 49 of Gundam Seed Destiny, the cast is ordered Sheen, Othran, Kida. In the last episode, in the extended episode, it goes Kida, Othran, Sheen. Like, they literally what give the him top billing in the last episode. It's like, what TV show have this you been watching, people who made the TV show or the director? Like, that's madness that you would think that that's, like, the thing you did was the big turn that Kida is, like, the protagonist at the end. It's like... It's impossible for me to consider him to be a protagonist character because he doesn't change. He doesn't grow. He doesn't fucking... He doesn't have any character to him in the show at all. I mean, one, is that even legal? <laughs> I feel yeah. like there's a contract thing there because, you know, I don't think the actor who voiced Sheen signed on for that. But whatever. Anyway, yes, I agree with all of that. Um, and... God, this is so frustrating. Yeah. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Uh, okay, lock us too. Yes. Because they do the same thing with Lacus. And when I and said, like, the thing Kira should do is something like Othran, because Kagali is a big old dum dum in this show. Oh, yeah. But at the bare minimum, Kagali has done nothing to, like, divest herself of power. She's trying. She's trying. Yeah. She is trying. She's the doing show a terrible is, The show is very bad about how it handles its female characters, and it's yes. very sort of, like, dismissive of her um yeah. and like proceeds to be dismissive of her for almost the entire show but at the very least in being dismissive of her it's dismissing her actually trying to do something yes she is out there pounding the pavement trying to like 
make change happen. We see we meet her on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. Yeah. No, wait, um, to to, <laughs> to the, the plants. plants. Yeah, uh, and 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 Othryn is with her. Well, Kira doesn't have the option to do that with his lady friend because Lacus has fucked off with him, which is even less believable yes. for Lacus because she was the mastermind who saved the world at the first show. Yeah, and this is like maybe the biggest fuck up the show has is is its usage of Lacus of. I mean, they just full-on Relina her from Gundam Wing. Yes. Like, for the first half of the show, I swear to God, 90% of her dialogue is her just going, Kira, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what have you done to Lacus Klein? Like, the most they interesting character from the first show, um, the who was such a fascinating, like, um, reversal of a trope and, like, just, like, such a great construction of a character that, like, defied your expectations yeah. and subverted what you'd expect that kind of character archetype to be to ultimately be, like, the most heroic, effective character in the entire show by the end. Um, especially when she should be, like, the like a great foil for Durandal because she is the other master manipulator. She's the person who has gone around and, like, used this very, like, princess-like aesthetic and archetype as a way to... Um, persuade people ultimately to her side, right? She, She's that's what she does for the whole first show for the first half of the Gundam. She scene. is the single least passive character in Gundam. Yeah, she is. She is the one that ultimately like brings Kida to his fruition as a character, right? Like she's the one who's pushing things to get the scenario she needs by the end, and it's such a great character. And then Gundam Seed Destiny. Like you should be, the, you should be the chairman of the plants. Like everyone would vote for you. Like, what? Like you should be the one in control. Why are you sitting here with your stupid fucking dumbass boring boyfriend on a stupid fucking island just saying Kita over and over again while you literally watch a fake version of you having been constructed by someone on the plants, like, create propaganda. And you just sit there and watch it and don't do anything about it until, like, the 40th episode of the fucking TV show. This is going to sound slightly offensive, but I don't know how else to express this idea. Okay. It seems like something is wrong with her. Like, mentally, like, it seems like she got a lobotomy. Like, the way in, like, fiction we code in, like, stories about mental institutions. Mm -hmm. like, like, fucking Jack Nicholson at the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It seems like between shows, she went somewhere, and they cut off her frontal cortex, and she is just this reactive blob of meat. To the point where, when she sees fake Locus, she's like, that's nice. Uh -huh. Good for her. And does nothing. Instead of immediately flying off to the colonies going, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, I fucked up. And trying to re re rectify it. She just doesn't. She just, she's like, oh, uh, propaganda Locus. That's nice. I'm going to go stare at the beach more. Kira. Yeah. It, it, that's what she seems like. Yeah, it, it just, it's, it's just... A completely unrecognizable character from what she is in Gundam Seed. Like, like literally, if bet like the inciting incident of Gundam Seed Destiny is whatever moment between shows, Laka ceded all power and let Durandal take over, even though she could have quelled him. And 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 that is the problem. If she had just decided, yeah, I'll be chairman, Seed Destiny doesn't happen. Exactly. Like it's <laughs> it, it's this thing where it feels like the show does it. For a similar reason of like what it does with Othran is so that you can just like have it so by the end of the show she's a captain of a ship again, right? Yeah. She goes like I don't want to say she goes through the same character arc because it's not actually a character arc there, but it's like but like image wise she goes through the same character arc even if none of the substance is there of being docile at the beginning of the show and then by the end she is like commanding one of the starships. Um, but the problem is in Gundam Seed you realize either on rewatch as you're watching it you see how they do it or in retrospect you realize oh that docile thing at the beginning was all an act that she was playing in order to survive and manipulate people um and here it's just like it comes across as totally earnest because why would she be trying to manipulate kita or something on that i like it's like there's no manipulation there's no like acting there there's no sense of her like deep intelligence that you get when you get that turn with her in gundam seed and it's a thing that I think the show kind of consistently does with a lot of its female characters, particularly with Lacus and Kagali, is it makes them very passive and it kind of infantilizes them um, in a way that I find, like, gross and deeply sexist. Oh, I mean, literally, with Kagali, it's Kira has to come 
pluck her out of her stupid wedding in her wedding yeah. dress because she's a dumb girly girl and take her to the ship and metaphorically slap her. He doesn't actually slap her and be like, you're an idiot, you dumb dumb. Why didn't you do this and why didn't you do this? And the rejoinder should be from Kagali. Fuck you! You've yeah, been living on a yeah, beach. Where were you, you fucking piece of shit? And like that's like what I was yelling at my TV for the entire first half of Gundam Sea Destiny, both times I've watched it. Because Kira's like dialogue in the first half of Gundam Sea Destiny, every time he's on screen, is him basically uh, just saying, like, why did the bad things happen? And why didn't you do something to stop it? And it's just like, what you you fucking piece of shit? Like you're you're the quote unquote ultimate coordinator, right? You're one of the most effective pilots in the entire history of the Gundam franchise, you sack of scum. Like, fucking do something about it. It's like, there's no... Because the worst part about it, in some ways, is it's like, there's no sense that he would ever even be a person who fucking would go raise orphans at an orphanage. Like, what is that? What does that have to do with Kita at He's all? He's also not doing any raising. Yeah. Lacus is doing the raising. He goes and stands out on the beach and criticizes people. Yeah. It's like, if at least if there was a thing, like, um, in Yakuza, Kiryu, he eventually, like, in Yakuza 3, he goes and, like, raises orphans at an orphanage because he was an orphan, so there's a clear reason why that would come full circle. And then he also is literally also raising an adoptive daughter at the same time, so might as well run an orphanage, right? Um, and that whole character arc is about him finding and, like, trying to create a family for himself. But that's, like, not a character arc that's part of Kida. Like, that's not something that he has. So, but at the very least, if there was something that it felt like Kida was so traumatized by the war or whatever, and he just needed to, like, live this peaceful life, at least it should be a peaceful life that, like, connects to what we know of him as a character in some way. It just feels to utterly arbitrary that he's on this fucking beach. Yes. So I want to address one thing with Kira, okay. is that I've, I've tweeted a lot of these thoughts, and I've had disagreements from some listeners that say, like, no, Kira was always this way, and he's always stupid. It's, and it's not true. And, no. and so here's my argument, because I, I had one exchange with a listener, and I thought he made some good points about how the plot of Gundam Seed, the original, is kind of artificially constructed to make Kira look good in some situations. And I do agree with that. I do think there are some problems in how that show is constructed where, like, Things, it doesn't, like, like, Kira does not feel like someone who has to, like, learn and adapt and earn things quite as much as, like, an Amaro to become powerful. No. Yeah. And I do think that's true. And I think some of that's intentional and some of that's unintentional. What I very much disagree with is that Kira is not godlike or omnipotent in the original show. He is very human. He is very um, vulnerable. He cries. He has doubt. He has moments of failure. He has moments of fallibility. Uh, he has moments of weakness. He is discovering things about himself and his body, like sex. He is a he is a human being. I will concede and totally think he is far from the most charismatic or like interesting, watchable Gundam boy. That is one hundred percent true. In fact, he's he's like he and Hero Yui are kind of on even footing. Is sure. like the least in that sense. But I think Gundam Seed actually has a pretty like self conscious use of that type. Whereas Hero is just like he's cool because he's quiet. With Kira, it's like. He's quiet because he's asleep. Like, that's kind of the point of that yeah. character, is he's asleep for the first half of that show, and the vulnerability grows and grows and grows until, like, he takes a life very viscerally and cuts a boy in half, and then goes, fuck, and breaks. Yeah. Right? And so, and even up to the end, he has doubts until the final moment of Seed is him f floating in space crying because of everything he's been through and because of the overwhelming beauty of like having fought hard enough to create a scenario where nothing is perfect but we have a chance to live yeah and that is the arc of kira yamato and and it is not perfect by any means but it is a really clear human character arc and he is not a human being in gundam seed destiny right yeah. he has had a full character transplant and like, yeah, you can agree that maybe the show glorifies him a little too much. And I do think Seed has, in both incarnations, sometimes leans too much into the like rule of cool kind of thing sure. in some moments. And like, you know, um, and I think there's a good point to make about like how much work the fucking <laughs> crazy freedom Gundam does for him in the second half of Seed of like, I thought one really good point this listener made is like, part of the reason why Kira can talk such a big game in the second half of that show is he has a, a fucking mobile suit that can shoot an infinite number of beams and take down enemies with precision. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, but, like, but, but I think for me, one of the things that Gundam Seed is doing is it's operating on a different register than most Gundam shows, which yeah. is true of Seed Destiny. Seed Destiny is just very bad at operating on that register. But it's like, 
the, but Kira gets the Freedom Gundam because he's earned it, right? The Freedom Gundam is as much a metaphor as it is a literal mobile suit, It's right? Excalibur. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, Lachis literally calls it a sword, right? Yeah. When she gives it to him. It's like, I will, bestow, yeah, I will bestow this sword upon you. Like, that's where him being Jesus Yamato in Gundam Seed, he is kind of Jesus Yamato in the sense of, like, in the interesting version of Jesus who was a fallible, real human in some, like interpretations of, of the Jesus-like story or the history or legend, however you want to think about it, um, who was who struggled with being what he was, right? And and th that nothing was, like, just easy for Jesus. The dude got fucking crucified, right? It's like, it feels like a very earnest version of the Jesus story, not this sort of, like, pacified version of it. You vaguely get, like, conceptually and see destiny. And so Kida is metaphorically killed, uh, in heaven, he realizes his mistake once he's removed, and he makes an active choice to go back to Earth. In that case, both metaphorically and literally, because he is in space. Um, and <laughs> to go back to Earth to fight something that is real and that he really believes in. And making that choice of breaking the shackles on him is what earns him the right to, to freedom. Which, again, it's not a subtle fucking metaphor because no. the Gundam's literally called the Freedom. And so it's like, I, I understand, like, with people who don't like Seed, I think one of the reasons is because, like, the story operating on that register it might not work for some people. But if you're, if you're interested in approaching that show in the way it's trying to construct its story, like, Kida is an incredibly compelling character because of that arc, I feel like. It's, it is really smart in how it's doing that. And like I said on the Gundam Seed podcast, it's effectively working in the same kind of register that a really good Superman story works in. Because Superman is also a Christ-like figure, in case you didn't notice, right? Um, yeah. And so th that's that really compelling version of this character archetype. See Destiny, to continue that, is like the Superman that like people vaguely think of Superman as, who haven't read good Superman stories. That's just like, oh, he's just like all-powerful, and it's never interesting because he just wins no matter what. And it's, and it's just like he never really changes. He's just like what he is. He never has doubts and fears and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't feel human. And that is true about bad Superman stories in the way that it is true about Kida in this is that he just feels like a robot that is like flawless, um, that he only loses to Sheen because like the plot needs it to happen. It like doesn't even feel like, I don't know, like it feels like Kida would be able to stop the whole war if he just decided he wanted to on the way the show presents him in this fucking show. He is infallible in all things. Yes. He has no doubt. He has no vulnerability. He sheds no tears. He shows no human emotions, like even something like carnal, like sex, which is there in the original show. He has no sexual interest in anyone. Yeah. It's him and Locus are completely chaste. Like they might as well be the brother and sister pair in this mm -hmm. one. Um, and and he has he is never in doubt that he is right, and he has absolute rightness, and that means everyone else is absolutely wrong. He has no real interest in listening to other points of view because by design, if he is God, they cannot be valid. Um, and he cannot lose except by Sheen, like kind of manipulating a flaw in the system, which if the show were like, and I, I really do like that fight because if the show were on the wave, like I want it to yeah. be on him breaking the infallible man is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, really for me, if you're like doing the, how do you make Gundam see destiny good? You kill Kida in that yeah. scene. Like yeah. Kida had to die at the midpoint yeah. of the show for the show to once, once Kida survives that, like, the show is over. Like, it uh, Because also, it. the show has no death. Yeah. Like, and I'll just bring it up here, because we just mentioned it. People don't die on this show. Yeah. They literally can't. Kira is stabbed through his fucking cockpit, and then a thermonuclear explosion happens with him at the epicenter of it, and he has a bandage around his head. There's something in that scene that I have never understood what it is doing, because you see it explode, and then at the beginning of the next episode, it has a shot of Kira, and he has this, like finger on the like turn off the nuclear reactor button it's like it exploded in the last episode like what did like the explanation is supposed to be he turned off the nuclear reactor but it's like that's not what we saw we saw it explode it wasn't the gundam got stabbed and then it fell quietly into the ocean it fell into the ocean the entire ocean fucking exploded and then they do it again with Othran. yes and, and, and Mayrin Mayrin is yeah. in there and then you find out Moo LaFlaga from the last show who literally was incinerated into nothingness. His yeah. particles did not exist anymore and just to put a cherry on top, he also had a thermonuclear yeah. explosion. And he was in space and the last thing you see of him is his broken fucking bloody helmet flying through space. It's like, even if somehow he survived the explosion and the getting disintegrated by a space laser, he still would have suffocated to death. And he has a scar 
and Atherin has a little bandage around his head, and Marion is totally fine. She yeah. has no injuries. And that's death in Gundam Sea Destiny, unless you are shot by a bullet. Then you die, and, yeah. M- and Mir, when she dies, this is the funniest thing in the history of Gundam to me, is Mir dies from one bullet wound, surrounded by four people, Athrin, Kira, Mulaflaga, and Meireen, who have all been at the center of thermonuclear explosions. Yes. That's Gundam Seed Destiny for you. Yeah, it is. It is like taking the concept of plot armor to the most absurd extent I've yes. ever seen it. Where yeah. it, it like so much of Seed Destiny for anything to happen the way the show wants it to happen has to contrive ridiculous plot bullshit. So it's like it and both wants to have you feel like oh god, Kira got killed, or oh yay, Kira got killed, depending on how you're watching that scene. Um, but then also want to just like, but we actually want Kita to be the hero at the end. So he has to just sort of miraculously have survived. And also that's not even a reveal that they save for like a big, like twist later yeah. on. It's like, it's the little next episode. It starts with him having survived. Well, and like, it also becomes this problem for Sheen where Sheen has this trajectory, like most Gundam boys of getting more powerful and powerful. He becomes powerful enough to kill Kira. He becomes powerful enough to kill Othran, but because of the plot armor, they live. And then because of the way the show has contrived itself, they also then have to magically kill Sheen who becomes a dramatically worse pilot yeah. in the final episodes of the show for no discernible reason. Yeah. And so <laughs> it, the show is just sort of contorting itself to get all this shit to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I hate Kira. If we haven't made it clear enough yeah. already, Kira in Gundam Sea Destiny is the worst Gundam character. Yeah. He is infuriating. Yeah. He is annoying. His entire philosophy, which the show feels like it's very behind, is what part of what I hate about it, is that his absolute rightness in being the guy who can come in and tell everyone else they're wrong, despite him, they're, they're all at least fucking trying. Because they're in their mobile yeah, they're doing fighting. something. Yeah. They're doing something. And he comes in and says, no, you're wrong. Causes utter chaos on the battlefield. Gets a couple people killed and then leaves going, oh, that went well. He's basically like the guy in that Sailor Moon meme who comes in and says, <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. I have solved everything. And then Sailor Moon says, but you didn't do anything. And he leaves. Yeah. And that's Kira Yamato in this show, but with no sense of irony. It's like if Sailor Moon viewed that character as Jesus. <laughs> that's what this show is. Yeah. And it is infuriating. And it becomes like... Trying to break down the actual, like, world philosophy of this show is so difficult. But if you had to describe it, what this show ultimately comes down to is this view that any war or violence perpetrated by national nation-state actors is inherently wrong no matter the cause. Yeah. World War II? No. We should not have fought Germany. Germany was wrong, but it, was e- it would be equally wrong to fight against Germany. That is this show's view. And that the only proper action can come from non-state aligned actors who are sure in their own righteousness. And what I just described is terrorism. I want to be clear. Yeah. It's, it is, it's just, I mean, it's a thing where the show is just so disinterested in its own politics. I think it has yeah. no idea yeah. what it is saying. Because you're, yeah. you're basically right. It is just like, like if you want to be generous, it ha- generous, it has like an anarchist viewpoint. But it doesn't really. Because no. it, it doesn't have any viewpoint. Because it also is like... Weirdly glorifying of Orb as this like fucking Orb as as it it takes this weird nationalist turn where Orb is obviously like a stand-in for Japan, um, the island nation that also has all its (laughs) mobile suits named in Japanese words like Akatsuki, which means Don, which is also um, the Japanese flag, which has like the imperial connotations. There's like some uncomfortable, I think, nationalistic politics around Orb that again. I don't know if the show's doing it on purpose. I don't know if it's just doing that completely by accident because it has no idea what the fuck it's ever doing. Well, okay, so there's. I had this problem in the original show, too. Yeah. Orb is an inherently hypocritical nation mm-hmm. because they are the most technological and military, militaristically advanced nation in the cosmos in the world of Gundam Seed. But they are also devoted to absolute peace. Now, I think through the characters of Kagali and her father and some other figures in Orb, it, th- it, it squares the circle enough. Like, it, it threads the needle enough where I can kind of look that aside and say, okay, but they, like... There is a nuance to this, like the the dad, the the king, he is he has this view, but he's also willing to like trigger the nuclear option and blow the entire kingdom. Come, yeah. Well, I think specifically Orb's viewpoint is supposed to be that it's it's not about peace specifically. It is it is about um them, you know, their their belief, and again, this is basically like part of the Japanese constitution of them not being able to have a standing military. Part of that is this: we will not invade any other country, but we will also not allow ourselves to be invaded right right? like it's not it's 
It is like a more realistic real world version of what Relina tries to do in Gundam yes. Wing, which that is like, we will not invade any other countries, but if you want to invade us, I guess we're fucked. I don't know. Um, and that's yeah. Relina's standpoint with Orb. It's like, we are trying to move towards an ideal of peace, but we are willing to use force when it is absolutely necessary. Right. Now, the sheer degree of their like militaristic innovations mm -hmm. is such that that becomes kind of inherently hypocritical. It would kind of be like, if it, if they if it were Japan, but Japan had like the military capabilities of the United States, mm -hmm. and then made that claim, it's like, well, then why do you need a hundred thousand nukes? That would be kind of what it is because right. they have like the most powerful, deadly weapons of all mankind on their side. So it's fucking stupid, but like it it works enough in Gundam Seed, and it's enough in the background that I'm fine with it. But in this show, it is just so deeply hypocritical, and it and I agree with like some of the nationalists, like because like. It is Japan, and it is it is that sense, and some of this is true that Japan does that have this like technological superiority and everything, um, and is a largely peaceful nation. But then, but there are uncomfortable debates about that in Japan. Not everyone in Japan is happy with that. Not everyone in Japan thinks they should be a largely peaceful nation. Um, and, and this show has this kind of very simplistic fairy tale view of that. Where, where Orb is also, like Kira, kind of beyond reproach, even though we see Orb fuck up over and over again. Yeah. And, like, Kagali is a terrible leader, and they're taken over by a demagogue very easily. And then, like, all the people in Orb who were raised thinking this just go, well, he told us we have to nuke shit, so let's go do it. Which I don't believe they would do, based on what we'd seen. Uh, and Kagali also is a dum dum and thinks she can just fly in and say no, don't do that, and then they'll all listen to her, which they don't because she's a dum dum. And yeah, by the end, I will say I was fully on Sheen's side when he said I'm going to wipe that country off the face of the planet. I'm like, yeah, I think we'd all be for the better. Yeah, they're they're really problematic in this show. Go ahead, Sheen. But the show doesn't want them to be problematic. No, no. The show the show wants them to be like like it is. There is like a noble core to Orb, right? And it's like all the real military people are upstanding and they know the values of Orb. And they're all willing to risk their lives um, to help it. But it's those bad um, politicians that are, and it's like, that are like corrupting all of it. And it's just this very like ridiculous, naive and like feeling that also it feels like it contradicts something about Gundam Seed to me, which is like Gundam Seed at its core is generally speaking incredibly suspicious of like, large amounts of power concentrated in one place especially especially the military but when it's the orb military it's totally fine even when the orb military is going out there and fucking shit up and defying their ideals it's like you still shouldn't blame them too much because right. it's like they don't really want to they're just following orders and there's a part of like, it that just makes me very uncomfortable about its treatment at and orb and how it defies a lot of what feels like was some of the political perspectives that Gundam Seed had that I had thought were interesting. Like, here's a great example of where it becomes super frustrating is the second time Sheen uh, and the Minerva have to fight the Orb forces because it's the, it's once Orb has joined up with the Earth Alliance, there's one fight that it's the first time Kira comes down and fucks shit up. And then there's the second time. And on that second time, Sheen, it's when Sheen invokes the like seed factor. Yeah. And goes ape shit and starts destroying Orb carriers and he kills Captain Todaka who is, we knew him from the original show, and he's the guy in Sheen's flashback who is, like, really kind to him after his parents die. Yeah. And his little sister. And and so it's supposed to be like, oh, Sheen has gone off the deep end. He killed he killed that guy, and that guy was nice to him. And I'm like, then they're like, he was trying to wipe Minerva off the face of the earth. Like, Sheen kind of had to do that. He, he ended the battle. They were in a pitch battle. They all, like, you can say what you want about war. They all agreed to be there. They're all <laughs> in the battle together. It's, it's, it's not... Captain Todaka wasn't going to, like, do something cool and, like, fire on the Earth Alliance forces and be like, we don't have to fight anymore. He was going to kill him. Like, what are you blaming Sheen for here? Like, yes, war is bad. It's bad to kill people. But the context does, in fact, matter. Mm -hmm. And it's something... And Sheen... They, they put Sheen in that over and over again, where Sheen does something that... You can't realistically blame him for because of how they set it up, but they want you to because he's acting against people the show has arbitrarily decided are beyond reproach. It's the same with Kira. Yeah. Like, like the funniest fucking... I already said the funniest fucking thing. Another very funny thing to yeah. me in this show is when Durandal and, like, the Zaft military decide... Okay, Minerva, you gotta go destroy the Archangel. They're fucking too much shit up. And then Murue, Captain Ramius, yeah. on the Archangel, gets the news and she's like... Why would they want to hurt us? And it's like, 
because you keep interfering in their battles and getting people killed and are an enemy combatant to them. And they're, like, confused. And then, like, Sheen goes out and fights Kira and kills him and then comes back and Othran's all mad. And, and, and Sheen's, like, literally just being like, what do you want? I was ordered to do this. He's tried to kill us. This is bad. Blah, blah, blah. And the show just completely takes Athrin's side. But it has no leg to stand on. So that scene is really weird and limp. And has no actual rhetorical framing to defend Athrin's point of view. Because they literally didn't start this. The Archangel started it. Yeah, I think this is where on my second... On my first rewatch, I think I saw it from that way. On my second rewatch... Um, it became more of a, like, especially like this, like, well, if the show's going to treat Kida as so unfallible, like, you kind of just, when you know that that's ultimately just where this is going to go, you have to kind of run with it. And there's a certain amount of frustration with, like, maybe this is where we just start talking about fucking Sheen, um, because I just don't know what the show knows, if it knows what it wants to do with him as a character ever. Um, but it's like... If you see Kira as being effectively infallible and you're looking at like, well, Durandal's the ultimate villain, you know that he's the ultimate antagonist, and then when you have seen the show once, you know where that all leads and you know that they're all bad guys or whatever, it just starts becoming, well, like, well, now all the people on Minerva seem like fucking idiots too. Um, because with, like, Othran, like, Othran should know better. Like, he should know... Like, you already went through this exact literal same thing last time. When you see the Archangel show up, when you see Kira show up, you're like, well, what are they doing? It's the exact same fucking thing they did at the end of the last show. They're doing the same thing. They are a third party entering a war between two different factions, trying to basically stop the battle by fighting both factions at the same time and disable them. It is the exact same shit that you guys were doing literally only two years ago right it's the, the fucking school project you had when you were a sophomore it's like you shouldn't have forgotten it already asshole like as soon as that happens Othran should have just jumped ship and gone over to the archangel and be like well i don't know right now the full context of what they're doing but i have literally had this exact same experience before i probably should just go over and hang out with kita um and it's this really frustrating junction where that friction where you feel that friction between both visions of the show that if you're seeing it and from the Gundam C2 perspective it doesn't make any sense why Othran is on the Minerva for like a for it's like 15 episodes long of him there in fighting Kida and just like not not like going over to to his side makes no sense to me but like this is where I, I think the sh again when I say the show keeps almost figuring out what it's about and has to pull back. The scene where uh, Othran leaves the Minerva and goes and talks to Kira and, and Kagali and all those people on the beach, and you have the, the photographer lady, like, looking at them. Yeah, Luna Maria, stuff. yeah. yeah. Um, that scene is so interesting as, like, an inflection point for me because Othran makes some really good points, and you can feel, you can just feel at the keyboard the writer writing themselves into a corner, whoever wrote that scene, yeah. of Kira saying, but we want this, this, and this because we think Durandal is bad because of this. And then Othran retorts with all the actual diegetic information we have of why he, he joined Zaftigan, why he's with Faith, why he's doing this, why Sheen isn't a bad guy, all this stuff that diegetically is the more defensible position in that scene. Because Kira's, again, as we've said before, relies on extra diegetic, yeah. extra sensory powers. And you get to the end of that scene, and you can just I can just feel the moment where the writer goes, fuck, and like walks away from their keyboard for a moment and like walks in circles going, how do I square the circle and finish this scene? And what they come back to is Kira going, well, even so, okay, you go with God, Athrin, okay. And then they just go back, and the status quo continues unbroken. Yeah. And that's how it goes. Because what that scene should have been is some sort of meld melding of the minds where there is enough diegetic information on both sides that they are able to come together and figure something out and then like bring the Minerva into the fold. As feel like if you were going on the Gundam Seed 2 route, or if you're going on the Zeta Gundam route, you would have Kira go, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Like, but one of them. But what it is, is it's a complete stalemate. Yeah. And then the show just continues. And it's because the show, I think, has an overarching vision of like, this basic like philosophy it's chasing with with Kira that is basically unchanged from the original show, just yeah. a continuation of that dynamic. 
but it keeps writing itself because it clearly has no master plan. This clearly was not a show where they like planned all 50 episodes oh, and yeah. then executed. Um, and so they keep running into these things where they've written themselves into corners and have no rhetorical thematic way out of that corner. And so it just works itself into knots and, as you say, makes everyone stupid and has to rely on extra diegetic leaps and all of this stuff. Um, and just continue. And yeah, and, and nothing feels right or good. Yeah, because part of that it hits at, um, I think, one of the core writing problems with Gundam Sea Destiny, which is it cannot allow characters to make status quo changing choices. They always have to be forced beyond a, like any yes. doubt into whatever the status quo changes. Yeah, Othran doesn't leave Zaft until he has a hit on him and he runs and gets shot and then is picked up by the archangel. Yeah, and and it's and it's exactly what you're identifying here, where it's like in scenes where it feels like this would be a really compelling scene if a character made a choice here, if Kita decided to go a different to like have the archangel try to do something different because he was maybe partially convinced by Othran, or have Othran go, you know, it is pretty fucked up that someone tried to assassinate Lachis and that the chairman has a like secret fake Lachis, and I kind of have just let that be a thing. Which feels like something Othran probably should have been more inquisitive about and more, <laughs> like, proactive about. But, like, Kira tells Othran they literally sent a fucking assassination squad that was elite members of the Zaft military to kill Lachis. And Othran does nothing with that information. He, he never does anything with it. He just sort of walks away from that conversation being like, well, whatever. Where I'm, I'm in a war. And it's like, this is the character arc you had last time was... Well, it doesn't matter that you signed up for an army. You should fight for what you believe in, not for what someone else tells you to do. It's like you're now walking in the same circles. It's only when, you know, to, to walk back to the Kita Lakas stuff, the, it's only when people are, like, forced into that position, like Kira and Lakas, where the assassination squad goes to them, that they finally decide to go enter, like, the actual plot of the show. If that had never occurred, it feels like they would have stood on that fucking beach watching colonies drop and nukes get launched and giant lasers and fucking cities get blown away by Gundams, and they would have just been like, man, this is some bad stuff. I wonder why all this is happening. And they would have never gotten involved. Like, Othran would have never left Zaft I mean, if they went, didn't try to fucking assassinate him. It's ridiculous. Let's do Othran right now, because there's a one-sentence analysis yeah. of his character, which is he is completely passive. Yes. He is just utterly... Like, the most active choice he makes is when Kagali goes back to Orb, he decides to go talk to the chairman. But that is the only real active choice he makes, because otherwise he is either following people or being ordered by people. And so he goes and talks to the chairman and does exactly what the chairman suggests. Yeah. And then he goes to the Minerva and mostly just hangs out and does what the Minerva people want and sometimes disagrees, but never actually does anything about his disagreements. And then finally he is shot into the ocean, is at the heart of a thermonuclear explosion, magically survives, is picked up by a boat, gets on the Archangel. And now that he's on the Archangel, Kira says... You are now with, with Jesus and anoints his flesh and then allows him back into a mobile suit. And now Othran is with them. And he's worthless, even though he is by far the character with the most screen time in the first half of the show. Oh, yeah. He is like, he is effectively the protagonist of the first half of this show, but he has no arc. He learns nothing. He becomes nothing. He's still an entertaining character because I just think he's got a good design and voice and I really like Othran. Yeah. But, and he certainly never infuriates me the way Kira does. But like he, but that's because partially because he doesn't do anything. Yeah, so there's nothing to get him. infuriated about. Like he, yeah. he mostly just stands around and like does more or less what he's told, and then gets mad when what he's told to do is not exactly what he wants to do. But then doesn't do anything about it. And yeah. then, and then again, he just basically, broadly speaking, has the same character arc from the first show, just really poorly done of him being like, a, "Oh man, this was really fucked up. I got to join the military to do something about this fucked up thing that happened." And then it's slowly over while he's in the military, is like, "Man, the military keeps on." Ordering me to do things that I really don't want to do and don't think is best. Maybe I should eventually not do that. Um, only now, instead of him actually just making the individual choice to say, no, this is enough. I have to find out what to do on my own. He is forced to go on to the other side. And then when he's on the other side, he's like, yeah, and you know you were right. Like, it is kind of nice to fight for what I believe in and not just what I'm told to do. Anyways, I'll let you do all the fighting now, Kira. And I'll just kind of be in the background of a bunch of scenes. And then, like, his final moment is he defeats Sheen... And gets mad at Sheen for caring about things, I think, is the tenor of that scene. So he wants to kill the future, too, I think yeah. is what Othran says. Yeah, which makes no sense. Um, no, I, Othran is awful in this show. Not in a, like, a distracting way, but it is bad. And, um, yeah, that's all there is. And here's the thing. 
if you take, let's take Durandal out of the equation for a second. Okay. I do think there's an interesting version of this show where it is challenging, like, Kira's views on the wrongness of war in all things, because there's a version of this where Durandal is not the puppet, to, puppet master doing right, everything, yeah. where, like, Othran's choice to go back to Zaft is right, because Earth has become radicalized and is doing something really bad, and Zaft really does have to fight and put down this faction and try to make a more peaceful world order. This is... You know, if if you take out your knowledge that Durandal knows everything, for most of this, this looks less like World War One, where everyone lost their minds, which is what Gundam Seed is. Yeah. And more like World War Two, where where one country or set of countries, the Axis basically, lost their fucking minds and decided to genocide everyone. And so the other nations, they don't want to fight, but they have to because it's a literal fight for survival. And that's kind of what this is framed as. And if that were Othran's choice of saying, like, I actively left my country in the last show, but things have changed enough that I actively have to go back and make a new choice, that's an interesting sequel. Yeah. But that's not the show. No, that's not the show at all. Um, and, be, and again, and, and it's like when you watch the show from the beginning with, like, knowing that, like, well, all this shit just happens because of Durandal, it's like... All of those scenes that feel like the first time you watch them have some kind of like interesting nuance or there's a divergence point, like that just gets shut down because yeah. it's like impossible to watch that scene where Kira and Othran argue without in the back of my head thinking, yeah, but uh, but the chairman is doing all, like he's the one who dropped the colony on the earth. Like he's the one who's supplying Phantom Pain with this fucking shit. Like he's, he's the one manipulating this whole scenario. So it's like, it's, so it's like, it's when the characters are just wrong because I already know that shit. It's so hard to get invested in those scenes. And, and the way they're wrong, it's, it's, and you're yeah. right, because it's a, a kind of wrong where it's never wholly based on what is actually available to them. Yeah. They're always wrong or right in a way that is not fully aligned with the diegesis. So yeah. Kira is more right than he should be based exactly. on what he has, but Othran is also more wrong than he should be based on what he has. Like, Othran is probably right to throw a little cold water on Kira, but also the Lacus thing should be troubling. Yeah. But Kira should also be a little troubled by, like, some of the things Othran points out. But there's none of that. It's always... It's very absolutist in regards to the plot, but not in a human, like, we have limited points of view. Yeah. It is it is profoundly profoundly frustrating when you're watching it. Even even on a second time, it somehow gets more frustrating. I, I would imagine. I can't imagine watching this show a second time, Sean. Yeah. I gotta say, right now, like you you had like a five year gap. For me, it's just like in the haze of this. It's like that sounds like like putting me in the, in a in a fucking like torture device. Yeah, is trying to go through this again, knowing what I know. Um, but yeah, it's pretty crazy. Let's talk about Sheen. Yeah, we gotta talk about Sheen because he is the character. I feel like. My, on the second viewing done so dirty yeah i oh can't boy. i was just like when you know that ultimately he is like the biggest wet fart of a main character in any show ever because he when you watch fucking the hd version of gundam seed destiny you go from feeling like from sheen is the gundam boy he's supposed to be the protagonist there's a whole the best part of the show is the middle arc where he is the protagonist and you're like the Sheen is fascinating. He's a really good character. And then by the time you get to the end, when they do this, the HD version that has the extra episode content built into the show, he's taken out in the penultimate episode. The end of episode 49 is when Sheen is defeated. So he spends almost the entirety of the last episode of his own TV show doing nothing. And that was the first time I watched it. You get an entire TV episode of the show where it's just like, he's barely even in it until the end. And then the epilogue is all basically about Kira being like, a, oh man, I well, everything I was about was really right, huh? And it's like, yeah, I guess so. Let's shake hands and then walk away awkwardly. Again, it's it's a Jesus disciple yeah. moment of like, you were wrong and now you are right. Come yeah. into my flock, young young sheep. And it's, it's going from that of being like, man, this is a really interesting character to the show shitting on him so hard he doesn't even re like meaningfully appear in the final episode of his own TV show is why I have not been able to stop thinking about Gundam Seed Destiny for five years. Because I have never, ever, ever encountered a show that did its main character so dirty. Like, it's, it's like inconceivable to me let's that use, this is something that you would do with a character. Let's use the Game of Thrones example for a second. Yeah. Let's say Game of Thrones has no main character, but it has its main characters. Yeah. And like Daenerys Targaryen is one that you can say, because they did. They did her really yeah. dirty in that Like the most season. controversial element of the last season is what they do with her in the ending. Yeah. yeah. It should probably be what they did with Jaime, but that's okay. We're going to say it's Daenerys. Yeah. Because the thing is, 
And it's very bad, but it's bad because of steps they skipped, not because it's impossible for that ending to make sense for her. There is a version of Game of Thrones, and I think we're going to get it if he ever finishes the final two books, right. where this is a, a, an organic thing that might have happened for her. But it is done in such a shitty way. And part of why it is so infuriating is you can see the seeds in there of where if they'd done 10 seasons and if they had nuanced her more throughout and in these final moments, it could be an interesting downfall for that character. This is, this is a little different. This is where yeah. like they just full on rip, pull the ripcord and, and parachute him out of the show. Yeah, they, they effectively just give up on him. Yes. Um, and it's this thing where you are waiting... Like, the whole show for Sheen to have some kind of big character turn. Especially after the Stella stuff where, like, I don't know if it's as much of a character turn as the kind of, like, doubling down on the trajectory he was already going on. But you're waiting for him to have some sort of revelation about something. I don't know, like, you know, it needs to be something. Like, with the version of the show that, like, what it wants to be and what it's trying to be with Durandal as the antagonist. Like, there has to be a moment... It feels like where Sheen realizes that he's being manipulated. Like, that has to happen, right? Or you go full Anakin Skywalker and he becomes the bad guy. Yes, or he becomes the antagonist. Yeah, and he's like full on ultimate power, Darth Vader, uh, fuck it, I've made my lot, here I am. But he's neither. Like, he, yeah. he becomes a non-element in the, like, and it's not even just like the last episode or last two episodes. It's like the last, like, ten episodes of the show. He's doing stuff that feels so disconnected from the plot. Because the show has focused so heavily on Kira and the Archangel that everything that uh, Sheen and the Minerva crew do feels like it's on the margins of where the show's focus is. Like, they're going off, like, cleaning up all the shit with, like, like the Earth Federation and all that. When now we're full on, like, dealing with Durandal and, like, focusing oh, on Kira's POV. Here's one of my favorite examples. Is, is so, Jabril, Kira lets Jabril go. Yeah. And then Jabril goes and fires his space laser and kills billions of coordinators. Kira never reacts to this. And then, very reasonably, um, Zaft attacks Jabril and goes to the moon and does this attack and reclaims the Requiem system, right? Yeah. And that episode is one of the only episodes in the final core that Kira does not feature in. Um, because it's, I'm sure he's there, but like he's not the main yeah. focus of that episode. That is an actual Sheen Minerva episode where Sheen and Ray and Luna Maria and all those characters fight and, and retake the Requiem and kill Jabril. And you have Ray like firing and, and Jabril melts, which means he's probably fine. They put a bandage on his head yeah. after he melted. He's, he's going to be in the movie if they ever yeah. make it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he'll have a little scar and that's how you know he melted. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and they do that. And, and it is so telling that like, well, that's a very necessary military action to go take the super weapon out of the hands of the Hitler character. And Kira just doesn't even get off his ass and go help with it or do anything because it's not a case where he can easily scold both sides. So he's like, yeah, they've got it. They're, they're going to be fine. And that's the most important thing Sheen does in the end, in part because we know really Durandal wants it to use it for himself to fire on orb. And that's what the final episodes are about. Not that I think the show was planning that far ahead, but like... It, it That to me is like, that's the only time he kind of comes out of the margins, because it's the one thing Kira is disinterested in, which is actual conflicts where there's a difference between two sides. <laughs> and and especially on rewatch, that episode feels entirely like an episode that's just about crossing T's and dotting I's in the plot. Oh, because, totally. Because, because you're past the point where you where Sheen can have a character turn. Yeah. And so you know... Well, nothing dramatic is going to be generated from this. All that needs to happen is you have to have Jabril get killed here. He should have been killed. Like, honestly, all the shit of Jabril escaping, going to orb, like, that is another huge mistake the show makes. It's another way where the show writes itself where no character makes, like, what feels like a interesting choice to change the status quo. It's just like, well, it just has to be this way because Jabril escaped and he went to Orb. So, of course, Durandal has to attack Orb. It's not a, well, now Durandal has defeated all his opponents. So now he has to step over that line and becomes menacing or whatever, you know, fucking like 15 episodes before the ending of the, the show instead of three. It's a, like, you know, they keep on doing that element. And so at this point, once you've gotten to that, it's just like, well, th all of this is just you wrapping up random little plot thingies to set up the ending. It's the entire episode. And it just makes everything with Minerva feel so inert because you're just using them to wrap up random plot threads. You're not using them for like drama. You're not using them for like character development. You're not even really using them for thematic work because 
everything you're doing here is on the margins of where the show's attention has now been focused. Exactly. Yes. Let's get back to Sheen, though. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 this came out of our Sheen discussion. Right. I, I don't know how to phrase this other than I really like Sheen as a character, but I also think he's a failure of a character yeah. because of how the show uses him. It's a really hard space to be in because I think Sheen is easily one of the most interesting Gundam protagonists. He is by far the most different of any Gundam boy yeah. we've had in all sorts of ways. One of them being, we never see him get in the suit. He trains and becomes a soldier and gets in the mobile suit off screen. So he starts the show as a soldier. That alone is like really fascinating to me as a move Gundam um, has never made at this. Well, okay, with Hiro Yui, I guess we have that. Yeah, but um, Hiro is not a great character. But, right, right. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's a little different with Hiro. But, but Hiro also is like distributed in other ways too. Yeah. Um, but Hiro is also like straightforwardly a good guy. Sheen is someone who has an immense trauma that is, and most Gundam boys start with some degree of trauma, but his is like visceral and violent. I mean, yeah, his is way more extreme yeah, than a than normal anyone. Gundam protagonist. Yeah. yeah, like, I mean, literally that scene is shockingly violent. Yeah. Uh, they, I know because they replay it 45 million times <laughs> uh -huh. of like his little sister's, you know, severed arm in front of him. And like that kind of like deep embedded like PTSD trauma. Uh, and also it being a family he loved. Like, Camille also watches both his parents die in the first five episodes of Zeta Gundam. He didn't really like them that yeah, much. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> Camille's trauma is that he has this very, like, frosty relationship with his yeah. parents because they, none of them really pay attention to him. Right. Uh, so Sheen lost something very real, very tangible, very loving, and became someone who is sort of marked by hate in that way. Then he is a soldier... Uh, and he is fighting in this war, and he is, like, corrupted by forces of darkness. All of these things, like, it is just, it is such a vastly different idea for a Gundam boy than we've ever had. It is such a great contrast with Kira. It's like, if, if I have to point to the thing that, that is, like, the, the, the potential that is frustrated most by Gundam Seed Destiny, it is this idea that, that Sheen is this really fascinating character that they fuck up. Uh, he's also a great character design. Yeah. I love how he looks in, like, especially in that red, like, pilot suit he has. Um, I love the hair color. I love how he looks in relation to Kira and Othran. He looks, like, a little more human, I think, in, like, because Kira, Kira has those eyes that are just, like, yeah. so incredibly bulbous that, like, he has this kind of, like, he's like a, but he's like a beautiful butterfly. Uh -huh. And then, like, Sheen is a little more, like, real to me. I yeah. don't even know how to say this. And I also think it's a phenomenal vocal performance. Yes. What's the name of the actor? Uh, Kenichi Suzumura, uh, yeah. who's an incredible actor. Um, he's uh, Zach in Final Fantasy VII, which is on the top of my mind because, you know, yeah. that was last year I played all those. Um, and he's in a shit ton of stuff. He's a great, 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 great actor. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he and gives a phenomenal performance here. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is not a case where, like, there was anything wrong with the conception of the character. The conception of the character is, like, a triple plus to me. Yeah, it's fascinating, yeah. yeah. It's and, great, and, and in all things, the design and the voice and the story and all of that. And, and when the show is, is rocking, which is in that middle section with Stella, where they are doing that with him, and they are basically redoing a common... Gundam archetype, which is basically the four Murasame story from Zeta, Zeta Gundam, yeah. but they are doing it here with a character who is so markedly different. It really hit me, and I do think episode, I think it's episode 30, called Stella, which is where she starts attacking Berlin in that thing, and then he goes and fights, and then Kira gets her killed. It is, I think that is a phenomenal episode of Gundam. It is like so well directed. It is so visceral. His pain is so real. The scream the actor lets out at the end of that and like the yeah. build of it is, a, is one of the best moments of acting in Gundam. It is just a great, great episode. And it is also the one where it's kind of the point of no return of either you're going to do something with Sheen there or not. And I do think I like the next couple episodes after that, too, because I think his, like, killing Kira is like, yeah, yeah, go for it, dude. Uh -huh. um, but then after that is when, really, he disappears from the show in any meaningful way. Because, yeah, because it's they abandon him as a protagonist, right? And it's, it's a larger scale version of what I was talking about with that Othran Kira conversation where the writers at their keyboard writes themselves into a corner and then goes, oh, fuck. It's they, they wrote to a point where either you are going to go all in on Sheen in one direction or another... Or you're going to pull the ripcord and parachute him out of the plot, and they pull the ripcord. Yeah, and it's incredibly frustrating. And it's that it was one of the things that on rewatch I was like really sort of like focusing on because I wanted to like see like where and how does this happen? Because the the 
the notion of Sheen being knocked out in spending the last episode of his own TV show crying on the moon, which is what it is. <laughs> He's sitting on his ass and crying on the fucking moon for the entire last episode. Um, like that is something that has fascinated me for like five plus years at this point. So it was one of the things I really focused on is like, how does this happen? How do you go from this show where I remember really liking the main character to that being the ending of the show? And it is interesting, like seeing, I think a lot of what are like minor missteps, I think early on that like cumulatively sort of fuck them over. And it's like, they just don't know how to course correct. And one of them is like not investing in Sheen um, until you get to like, I mean, you're getting like to like episode like 12 or 13 at some point. Um, before you're really like diving into Sheen as a character, he is mostly a non factor in like the first core of the show. Yeah, because uh, I remember you making a tweet that I found fascinating before I started watching Sea Destiny because you started watching it a little bit before me, which was like, I th th there's something weird about the Sheen character because this doesn't feel like he's a protagonist. Well, like, I, I made that at yeah. episode 13. So if people don't know when we say core, that's the term in Japan for like a season of anime, yeah, basically. Yeah, so it's 12 to 13 episodes, which yeah. is one season. Yeah. Yeah. And so like a show like. Any of these Gundam shows are made of four cores, each thirteen to twelve episodes. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, at the end, of, and and you can often chart like plot moments will happen at the end of a core. Yeah. Uh, so the the first thirteen are a pretty self contained core, if I remember correctly. Uh, and it was around yeah, because it's like episode twelve or thirteen is when Sheen. Tw episode twelve is when Sheen gets the the seed factor. That's when they have to leave Orb. And and I right. I tweeted around that time because that's when I'm getting out of the first core, and I say okay. And I, that was like my first big tweet thread on this show, I think. Um, and I was saying, this show is so... And what I said is, this show is profoundly weird. I'm not disliking it. I think it's pretty good so far. And I do. I think there's a lot of good stuff in those first 13 episodes. But we only... This is episode 12 and 13, and we only just now got a Sheen-centric episode. What's going on? And like, if you're watching it for the first time, he is very backgrounded in the first arc yeah. because you have the fight with the the, the uh, Phantom Pain at the beginning and he is there in all the action but he's not a plot mover. Uh, Kagali, Othran, and Durandal and Captain Gladys are the important figures there. Yeah. Not him. Then you get the attack with Junius Seven. He's there in the action. Not really important. You get to Earth. He's not even in the action because now it's about all the characters reuniting at Orb. Yeah. And then you get out of that and he gets his seed factor and at least he's foregrounded a little bit. But I wouldn't say he is consistently foregrounded until we meet Stella. And that is episode... I mean, God, where is that's, that? Yeah, that's your... Uh, I'm looking at it now. Wandering Eyes is the first time that Stella appears uh -huh. in the synopsis of an episode. So episode 21. That's uh, episode 21. And that's when they meet um, at the, the city where he finds her at the beach. Yeah. And that is where that stretch from like... That like 13 episode stretch from like 21 to Dude, the, the... 32 is Stella where she dies. Yes. 32 is Stella where she dies. And then he, he fake kills Kira in 34. I would say that stretch, 21 to 34, is the... not He's not the focus of every episode. But you could reasonably say that 13 episode stretch, he feels like the protagonist. Yeah. And it's interesting because it is easily the best stretch of the whole show... And yet you can also feel it's like, well, it's too late because mm -hmm. part of what I think is really effective about the four Murasame story they're trying to sort of copy a little bit from Zeta Gundam is that it happens in two chunks, right? It happens a lot early on. The, maybe like the bulk of it is they go to Earth. That's where Camille meets four. The Cyber Gundam stuff happens. All that happens. And then you have a long gap and then they go back to Earth and that's when four dies. And what's effective about that, part of what's effective about that is the contrast with Camille, how much Camille has grown, how much has changed in the position, his position in the war. Um, you have also then, like, done so much more to characterize him by his absence with Four, because you have all the stuff of him flirting with Fa, and, like, the complex, like, adolescent stuff, like, you know, Zeta Gum is a really good fuck TV show. Yes. Um, and so them trying to kind of ape some of that storyline, but instead compressing it all into one contiguous sequence of episodes... Um, is nowhere near as effective because we just don't know who Sheen is by the time that he encounters Stella. We don't get a lot of effective like characterization around the relationship to like really sell it. It's like there's so much of that works feels like almost entirely through the performances of the actors and the fucking music is really good. And so it just sells the emotions of a lot of that stuff. But it is not good at because see, Destiny never is good at this, like setting things up and actually paying them off in a longer scope way that you would expect for a 50 episode TV show. Um, and it's a big problem. And, and, and part of this, like also looking at the sequence of episodes, is it reminds me that of something I sort of noticed watching it this time, which is 
there are really only like one or two episodes of this entire show and it's kind of in this middle spot between them leaving orb and uh encountering stella where there are what i would consider to be normal episodes of gundam there's only like one or two by which i mean here's an episode focused on the main protagonist the gundam boy as they go out on like a mission for this one episode that's completed in the scope of basically one episode that is not like important in like a big plot sense but does meaningful work to establish status quos, to develop relationships between characters, to get like good like one-off action type scenes. And you have like the one episode where Sheen goes and he flies through the cave and then like goes behind them and like they liberate that one town because he goes and flies behind their encampment. Good that, solid episode. Yeah, solid episode. That is the one normal episode of Gundam that Gundam Sea Destiny has. Everything else is like some big plot kind of thing that's supposed to be happening because the show's trying to chew on so much plot with its all of its fucking characters that it doesn't have time to just spend time in a status quo getting to know the crew getting to know the ship getting to like just live in the politics of the world is a really important feature for a gundam show especially one that's like 50 episodes long and they just almost never do it for the whole show and it's crazy and it's it's something that i think means that the stella stuff in that store within that story arc feels really effective but it doesn't have the kind of cumulative impact on the show's run as a whole that it could have if they had spaced the show out properly and and had better pacing yes absolutely um yeah i mean a part of it is like it's so much like once you get to that stretch it's like fucking finding water in the desert yeah because what you just want is like character centric forward moving storytelling and i agree it's got all those problems but what it does have that everything else lacks is sheen one being a center and for the first and only time the only stretch of the show you have an active center of the show yeah where it feels like when we cut back that's the center of gravity and sheen is growing as a character he's discovering things about himself he meets this Stella girl and kind of falls in love or just at least like a it's someone he deeply cares about for the first time he's let himself do that since his family died um he is he you have the episode where he and ray go out and discover like the the fucking lab where they've been growing these yeah. people and is horrified by that he he is awakened to certain horrors of the world by what stella has been put through and kind of comes out of his own shell for a while about that he is working for other for someone else he makes big meaningful character choices that go beyond the scope of what he's been told in letting stella go and giving her back yeah, to that's Neo, like a, one of the only times in the entire show where the character makes the kind of choice i was talking about that's like he yeah. is not forced to make that choice he chooses that like he would rather do something that puts him at risk in order to save stella's life there's not a scene where like someone runs in with a gun and says like if you don't save stella and give them back to the other people then i will murder you which is what they do with like most other big meaningful character choices yes. in the whole show uh but and it's a good scene like yeah. him giving her over to neo and saying like promise me you will take her away from this world and neo it's one of the best moments neo has of like saying i i, I will and then inexplicably going back on that um i mean to be fair it's a phenomenally stupid thing that she does it's like no, it i is. know that you grew this person to be a weapon of war but promise me you won't use them as a weapon of war anymore yeah sure i promise let's go no i Thanks. yeah but but it, whatever it, yeah. it's the kind of stupid choice they're like Amaro makes stupid choices yes. and you get them. And it, is the, it is a Gundam Boy choice he makes. Gundam Boys have to make stupid choices so yeah. that they can make better choices later. The thing is, she stops getting to make choices. Yeah. So you have that and then you have the big final conflict where, uh, again, it's just... This is one thing I want to praise Seed Destiny for. Uh, it is a vastly better animated show than its predecessor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of that is just animation tech has gotten better. I think some of it is... is, is it's just they're better at it. Um and I also think episodically it is well directed. I think individual episodes have like you would say the overall series direction is bad for everything we're talking about. But episodically, I feel like people do good. Just just the basics of like boarding, action choreography, all of that scale. I think is actually much much better than Seed, which is frequently kind of confusingly staged to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's improved in the HD version, but I'm talking about the original. Um, and I think episode 32, Stella, is a good example of like that. Is just yeah. a phenomenally directed. Like in terms of the scope of what it's showing, it feels more in tandem with like a Gundam movie or like high points like the destruction of Dublin in Z Double Zeta. It's not as good as those things, but it's like on that level of like yeah. really showing scale. And it is. And then it's in this kind of almost like Eva vein of like that scale is is 
a manifestation of someone's inner turmoil and it's Stella's and it's Sheen's and it is this maximalist version of it. So you take this inner character drama and explode it out across the screen and it's very effective in that way. And it's also the, like one of the only times in, okay, there are two times where death is actually personified in the show. One is with Mir and it's fucking hilarious. And then the other one is here where he like lowers her body into the water in a scene boarded straight from Final Fantasy VII. Mm -hmm. But it's a good scene, so why not? Um, and it works because there's something bodily and embodied about death there that has an impact. And then it ends with Sheen having this like look of fury as he looks up at the camera. Great individual episode. Yeah. In the context of the series, deeply frustrating. <laughs> yes. And so on rewatching it, it's extraordinarily refreshing because you see it then set Sheen on the path of him doubling down on his, like, the hypocritical elements of the character, being presented many, many choices where he could make a character shift that would then lead to a much more interesting conclusion, and he never does. Um, and, it, and it is, like, the thing I was saying of characters never making choices until they're forced to, taking the extreme, because they push it to the exact limit of where it feels like, this character is kind of being forced to having to make the choice you know. Anyone who has ever watched a movie, a TV show, read a book, experienced a story in any format whatsoever knows this character needs to make a change. Like, it has to happen. It's just part of what fucking stories are at some point. Yeah. Um, and they keep on pushing him, giving these him these opportunities, and then he just kind of doesn't, and for repeatedly less convincing reasons. To the point where it's just like, oh, I guess Ray doesn't want me to, and he's my friend, because he's going to die, and I may feel bad for Ray. I guess that's why I'm not going to question anything about this destiny plan that doesn't connect with anything that Sheen wants, his viewpoint on the world, anything that he's desired, or anything as a character ever. He's like, I'll go kill a bunch of people to enact the destiny plan and never think about it or question it ever, because Ray's like, it's important, and I'm going to die. Because at the end of that Stella episode, all the ingredients are in place. He has experienced immediate loss with Stella. He has seen both sides of the conflict be horrible to this innocent young girl. One of them create her, one of them... I mean, they were ready to fucking dissect her on the Minerva. Yeah. He has broken with the existing ideology, or at least ideological system he lives in with breaking with Zaft in that moment and, and, and going AWOL. He has also seen the incredible destructive perversion of earth in what he thinks is earth with the psycho gundam and everything yeah. and so he has been pushed to like and again i think you could take it in multiple legitimate interesting directions but those are all ingredients for and they even cue it up at the end of the episode that the final shot as the theme song comes on is him looking into the camera just pure rage of like he's gonna be something else and a little bit in that he goes and kills Kira, but he already wanted to kill Kira. Yeah. And, and he also doesn't that, kill Kira, actually, so it doesn't feel meaningful in the way right. it would as an actual, like, plot yeah. thing that had weight to it. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if he actually fucking did that, this would be such a vastly different show. Yeah. But, um, but no, and then so just gradually from that point, instead of that being the, we've risen to this point of action, and then there's a split and big stuff happens... Which is how Seed does it with Kira getting, dying, yeah. and resurrecting. Which is the, almost the exact point that happens in Gundam Seed is, yes. is the early 30s in the episode point. Where it's like that's the turning point of the second half of the show yeah. where Kira dies. He comes back. He like is a very different character in the second half of the show because he's had those experiences. It feels like that's what's supposed to happen to Sheen here. And then it just kind of doesn't and you don't it's, really know why. He's a balloon that gets inflated all the way to the point of exploding. And then they poke a hole in it, and the rest of the show is just him deflating yeah. and deflating and deflating until he's crying alone on the moon. Yes. And that's how he ends the show. And it's, it's so frustrating. So I want to run down some of the uh, incredible hypocrisies of Sheen that he never questions at any point. He never has any moment of like self-reflection, of thinking about maybe I should question this, maybe I should do something else at all. Okay. Uh, hit us with them. Hit us yeah. with Sheen's hypocrisies. Yeah. So, Do you have a list like written um, out? I should have written a list when I was doing the show. I've, I've noted a couple of notes here while we were doing the podcast. There's okay. probably some others that I have forgotten. So if you can think of any others, okay. chime in with me. I think the biggest one, the most glaring one, that is like a parallel that I just don't understand how the show never draws. Um, since we're talking about Stella, this is the most fundamental one. Which is that the Destiny Plan thing that the chairman is trying to implement 
is, broadly speaking, extremely similar to what happened to Stella and what the Earth forces are doing with the Extendeds, right? They are creating people, designing their lives the way they want them to be, controlling them, manipulating them, and that is what the Earth people are doing. Sheen has seen that. He has saw their fucking facility. He saw Stella, all that shit. He never once ever makes that connection. He never thinks about it. It never occurs to him. It's just like something that is there. The show is doing this parallel. Like the show is doing it thematically anyways already. That's something I think the show is clearly doing on purpose is it's very interested in the ways in which people are being controlled and manipulated. And yet it never has Sheen questioned it ever, even though this is like the most like distinctive thing with his character is his relationship with Stella. And it would be such an easy thing to call back on. It would be the thing to make him break with the chairman. It would be an argument he could have with Ray when Ray keeps telling him things and Sheen just goes, oh, okay, Ray, that sounds good. He could actually like push back on that. Um, yeah, there's yeah. there's so much you could do with that. And he just never expresses any thought about it whatsoever. And it's, it's maddening. Um, another one, this is uh, the other one I think is probably the biggest. Um, and I just don't understand how this happened. Um, is so you have the scene where Othran and Maidine escape, Maidine being Luna Maria's little sister, um, and they're trying to escape. Sheen is ordered to gun them down without being given a particularly good reason. Just like, I, they sh he shot a guard, and it's like, okay, this person I've known for like six months and fought alongside, and this little, like, one of my best friend's little sisters who has never done anything wrong ever and just has been a character in the background that's just very sweet and nice. Sure, I'll just like not really question it and go and murder them. Um, and he goes and does that, and then he goes back, and he's very sad about it, and Luna Maria's there, and they hug, and we'll fucking talk about how out of nowhere that whole relationship is. Um, the thing that drives me fucking crazy about it is, Sheen's whole thing is that he has his phone from his little sister that he listens to all the time, especially in this last part of the show, and he never makes any connection to the fact that you just went out, you have now become the person that is murdering other people's little sisters, you stupid shit. Think about it for one second. Like, how is that something that never comes up? Is that you're going around killing people's sisters? Surely that is something that should make you pause about being in the military and all that stuff. If this is your whole motivation, it is the trauma of the loss of your family. Two things should have happened with that scene with Athena. Yeah. Either they have Ray go and do it, and Sheen doesn't do it, and then it's just, if you just need the pure plot mechanic of get Othran out of this situation, that's how you would want to do it. And then, like, Sheen and Luna Maria bonding would be much more believable, because it wouldn't be, you killed my sister, here, let me kiss you. <laughs> Which yeah. is what happens. Or, or, you do have Sheen go out and do it, and at the moment he's about to, like, do the final moment, do the final stab through the suit, you do a classic Fukuda-style flashback yeah. to him listening to the, the machine, and then flashbacks to his little sister, and then see Luna Maria and Maireen together, and then come back and he goes, <gasps> and stops... And then, like, something happens. Yeah. Either he goes off with Athrin, or he just lets him go, yeah. or something. E either he stops, and that becomes a catalyst for him to become a, like, more heroic character in the final phase of the show. Or he doesn't stop, and that's his Anakin moment. Um, and it's something that is, like, done with intention in the plot. Is like, he has crossed this line and has now yeah. become villainous. Um, like, that is, I think, a huge turning point where the show fucks up and not, like, committing to a direction. It's um, actually funny... How much, you know, flashbacks are talked about with Seed and Seed Destiny. I actually weirdly found them more egregious in the original, not in this one. Um, because in this one, there's all these opportunities for flashbacks that they don't use because it would contradict what they're doing in the moment. There are, yeah, there are a lot of scenes here in Gundam Seed Destiny where I feel like you should actually do, this is like a moment for the Fugitive flashback. Um, and they like have one that is set up, this is like connected to Sheen's uh, hypocrisies, where there's a really good moment. Um, I think it might actually be at the beginning of that normal Gundam episode, or it's like the end of like the preceding one, where Othran has this conversation with Sheen, where um, Sheen is like very happy. Oh, it's at the end of the, the normal episode, because Sheen's so happy about how powerful he is, and he like saved the day, all that shit. And then Othran tells him, it's like, you know, you're like really happy about all the power you have, but remember, like you wanted this power because you were powerless and you lost your family because of it, but now that you're the one with the power, you're the person who makes other people cry. Like, that's the side that you're on now. That is the setup for the Fukuda flashback that Sheen should have seen that moment a thousand times over the course of the show. In the same way that Kira sees over and over and over again the moment in Gundam Seed where Andrew Whitefeld says, like, we are enemies, right? And it's Kira, whenever Kira is thinking about the concept of being enemies, what that means, am I an enemy to these people, am I Othran's enemy, he always flashes to that moment because that moment made an impact on the character. It's maybe excessive, but it's at least an effective storytelling tool. And it's like... 
Othran gives him, like, the one, like, nice, like, mentorly piece of advice that Othran gives in the whole fucking show and his relationship with Sheen, which is nominally meant to reflect the Char-Camille relationship, but does not really serve the same no. function. Um, it's like the one moment that Othran has that is does that, I feel like, is a really good scene where you feel Othran's experience and the weight of what he's done in the first show, like, come to bear in his relationship with Sheen. And it never comes up again, and it really pisses me off because it felt like, man, that would have been a good way as a, like, part of a series of catalysts that eventually have Sheen be introspective about the actions he takes in the show. <sighs> Other hypocrisies he has. Um, just generally speaking, when they go and attack the Earth base that has the three other destroyed Gundams there, that are other also piloted by Extendeds, and I feel like Sheen has like a brief moment where he like reflects it on, hey, these guys are Extended too, but he never has a moment where it's like, man, I sure am just doing the exact same thing that Kira did only these guys are fighting military targets instead of destroying entire cities. Maybe I should reflect on, am I really that much better if I am also, like, just going and, like, destroying these people that are also being raised as weapons and being put into this thing? Like, when they are doing some stuff that's way less bad than what Stella was doing and I was really pissed off about her being killed. Never really thinks about it. Yeah. Um, just generally speaking, he never has to think about his culpability in the mass destruction that Stella commits, her destroying, like, what has to be killing millions, if not tens of millions of people. She vaporizes entire cities. Um, and he would have seemingly not stopped it at all. Um, and he's just like, never thinks about it really. Nobody ever forces him to confront the fact that it's like, that happened because you gave a, you gave what you thought was a person, but was really, a, they turned into a loaded gun back to the people ready to fire it. And you never really consider your culpability in that kind of frustrating. And then the one that is also just feels like a, this was a big turning point they could have given the character is when they attack Orb and Sheen is going to go attack Orb, and it's like this big full circle thing, right? Where his whole origin is, they attacked Orb, and my family got killed, and I just blame everybody involved with that war for the death of my family, and that's why I've gone um, to, to become a soldier and all this kind of stuff. Now he is the one attacking Orb. Othran flies in to, like, stop him, and it just feels like this... Well, there should be, there needs to be a, like, specific callback to that moment. Like, this is a time when you should be doing the flashback to his family getting killed. Or the fucking thing that they set up with Kida, where the one time he meets Kida in the original 50 episode TV show, not counting the epilogue, is in the fucking, the, the like, memorial to all the people who died in that attack, where Sheen goes up and he says, oh, I just hate these flowers because, like, humans plant these flowers, but eventually humans will also destroy them. It's like, you have become the person destroying the flowers, Sheen. They're like, flashing in a neon sign with big flashing letters that's like, now you are the one who is doing the destruction and attacking the country that you're from. And he never, like, fucking thinks about it. And it just becomes this, like, how is this not a moment where you become more introspective about your actions and change as a character? It, it is, like, incomprehensible to me. Even knowing that that's how it goes and watching it a second time, it made it kind of worse. Because it's like, it's, how, it's, how is, like, the show's, like, resisting so much momentum and, had, and where Sheen should be making some kind of character shift. It's funny because I agree with all of this, absolutely, and they are hypocrisies. But when I was watching the show, and, and I'm the first time viewer here, I wasn't viewing any of these as, through the lens of hypocrisies as much as the lens of missed opportunities for character growth. Because pretty much everything you just said are potentially productive hypotheses or uh, hypo hypocrisies. Yes, we 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 get, we went through alternative scenarios where each of those could have been a character moment of growth. Because every Gundam boy has moments where he's confronted with a hypocrisy. Yeah, no, like. Characters should be hypocritical because humans are hypocritical. Yeah. Um, it's not a problem that he is hypocritical. It's a problem that, as the protagonist, he never reflects on those hypocrisies ever for like the whole last second half of the show. Well, it's why the second half is so frustrating because he becomes so passive in the face of them yeah. and is almost a slave to those hypocrisies. You know, I and and I I will admit that that watching the show, I find all the Kira hypocrisies much more egregious for me, just because like he's the one who should know better. He's been the Gundam boy, and he's being a fucking hypocrite. Um, whereas these at least feel like the kind of hypocrisies a Gundam boy would be faced with. But yes, it's one of the many failures of Sheen is that they set up, they just keep setting up pins to knock down, and then they go buy the pin and don't knock it down. Yeah. It's, it, it's insane. It's, it's like the, with the bowling metaphor. It's like they set up those pins and then they go bowl in a different lane. It's yeah. like, what are you doing? You just set the pins up. Why are you walking over there? Like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. It's like, do you not know what bowling is? It's like, do you not know what characters are? Like, what is even happening on this TV show? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Sheen is... 
a giant bundle of missed opportunities. Just, just, and they keep stacking on top of one another until he ends the show crying on the moon in the lap of the woman who loves him despite him brutally murdering her little sister who didn't die because I hear is Jesus and can come back and bring other people with him. Yeah, it is, it is truly, truly frustrating and just leads to the most disappointing character climax um that also is like it's not just that he just sort of gets cuckolded on his own tv show right he has to watch (laughs) another protagonist go in and take over his tv show literally taking the top spot in the end credits which i still find fucking unbelievable um but it's true you can go fucking watch his end credits and it's it says kita number one on that last episode um it's just it's bad it's just it's just really fucking bad bad. okay can we talk about mirror for a second yeah, this is a complete non sequitur transition. Yeah, but I feel like we should talk about something a little lighter after Sheen. What the fuck was up with that idea for the second Locus? It's one of those things that like is nutty enough that I kind of go, huh, that could be interesting. I I really want the Mir Campbell TV show. Like like because <laughs> I think like that was actually on rewatch. I think that was one of my favorite parts of the show, mostly because it's so isolated from like everything else yeah. that it can kind of be fun and interesting on its own merits and it is one of the few times where i think the show is like reasonably successful at exploring the themes that it is actually trying to explore rather than the ones that is like stumbling back ass backwards into right right of it is she is the embodiment of like the chairman durandal's whole like control thing that he has taken this woman he has turned her into a tool of propaganda in the the guise of lacus and sort of like transformed her wholly but, the, but he can't actually do that, right? That is like, no matter how much you want to control someone, at her core, she isn't Locke's client. She's Mir Campbell. She's her own person. And it's like, that story concept, I think, is like very good for that theme that they're going for. And the couple of times where it sort of works, I do think it's, it's effective. Um, but it is so removed from so much of the rest of the show. Like, one of the craziest parts about it is it has basically no overlap with Sheen's story at all. To the point where in the epilogue they add in the final plus episode, Locus is in the same scene as Sheen. And I realized Sheen has no idea what the fuck any of that was, right? There's no resolution from his perspective. He doesn't know, is this the real Locus Klein? Was that a fake Locus Klein? Like, what was any when, of that when shit? When Locus goes and like invades Mir's telecast, you have like him seeing it and he's asks Ray like, well, wait, which one's real? Because he just doesn't. He's never seen her. Yeah. And it never comes up again for him because the show has no time to deal with that. But it's like, it's crazy how little that intersects with Sheen as a character, which is like the main way it doesn't work for me. But I think as a showcase for Rhea Tanaka's uh, acting ability, it is fucking phenomenal. It's the she, same actress doing both? Yes. That's amazing. She, she is so good at sounding like Locus and yet being different, right? Yes. Like it is like, she's so clearly a different character and her ability to like basically be an impression of her of Locke's Klein I, it's just like I think like just as a showcase of that I found that character extremely entertaining every time she's yeah. on the screen no I mean I'm it's one of those things where I'm always intrigued by it and I don't think they ever like fully pull off the potential of yeah. it and part of it is it's so colored for me by the ending for that character is so, so dumb, yeah. nothing and bad and like but even then like the 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 episode called Mirror it's fourth from the end and it is the recap, the inexplicable, we're almost done, let's do a recap episode. Yeah, it's the, the we literally had a recap episode, six episodes before that one, let's do one again. Yeah. And yet, I think there are, as, and that is one of the laziest recap episodes I've ever seen, because there are full scenes that are just, they play the song that they already had from her and do montages. But in the, like, diary they're reading from, I'm like, oh god, this is such a fascinating separate show to do. Yeah. Or a separate episode. If this were coming at a different point in the show, not where we should be, like, ramping up for the finale, or really in any other Gundam show in the middle of the final conflict... Um, Like, this is such a fascinating idea of this, as you say, this character who becomes a tool of propaganda but is still herself and has her own hopes and dreams. Great idea. The the, the big problem there is that... So you have the last five episodes. Two of those last five episodes are focused on Mirror, and the character's going and fucking around at a shopping mall and, like, her getting shot and then reviewing her diaries. And it's like, this is usually where... I mean, God, think of the last five episodes of OG Gundam. Uh Think of the last five episodes of of Zeta Gundam or any fucking other show. Even Gundam Wing is full steam ahead to the ending at that point. And that show is pretty disorganized down the home stretch. Um, And they're just like, 
waste it feels like the show expected it had a whole nother core to go or something and then it's like oh fuck we got three episodes to do a finale destiny plan big laser there's a second big laser why not yeah it's like well, well okay let's have kira fight rala cruze only it's ray the barrel this time and yeah it's uh, anyway we're yeah. pro mirror but they don't they don't yeah. do her justice she's also done dirty yeah, but like I think with Mir, one of the things I do think is very strong with her um, is like the way they parallel the sort of like pop star thing with the tool of propaganda. Yeah. Like I think I just really love her like ridiculous J-pop version of like Quiet Night, which is um, like Lacus's main song from the original show. Which all Lacus's music is like are these like long five-minute mournful ballads. Um, yeah. That are like very like subtle and quiet and like kind of depressing songs, um, and it turns into like here's this fun happy pop song, and you know her breasts are bigger and she's like jumping around in this very skimpy outfit, and it's like I think that that is like a very funny commentary um, that again if it synced up with a show that like was interested in exploring more of that stuff more specifically, I think it would have been really cool. Um, it just yeah. feels like it's sort of energy that feels a little bit wasted because there's nowhere for it to go. Um, and it just sort of, like, fizzles out by the end of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, we haven't... We, we mentioned Kagali around the edges. Do we want to go back and just... Yeah. Poor Kagali. Because um, I like her in the original show a lot. And I think she... I mean, relative to all the other returning characters, is more active and, like, smarter. But then she also has to be a giant dum-dum and let Orb go to shit. And it's so dumb. Yeah, it's. I think it's like there's something very sexist to me the way the show treats yes. Kagali, especially in that like first arc where like there's the degree to which she is like passive and infantilized by characters in the show and the show itself um, is incredibly frustrating when it feels so contradictory to her arc from the first show. Like it just feels like she, again, it's another instance of her feeling oftentimes like a different character. Like. It never, like, Kagali was never a character that felt like she would ever back down from something that she believed she was right on in the first show. Like, that was, like, her main characteristic, right? She goes off half-cocked, but she's always, like, aimed in the right direction. Um, and in uh, See Destiny, it's just, like, she just kind of gets passed around and used by different characters. Um, and it feels like if the show was setting that up for, but then she really comes into her, her own in the second half, I could maybe accept it. But it doesn't even really do that. Like, she becomes more prominent and she's trying to be more active. She mostly fails in what she's trying to be more active at. And then when she does finally start being like, and now I'm really going to lead Orb and I'm going to, like, take the position my father had, she's basically, like, shuffled off the show to the point where in the extended version of the ending, in episode 51, she's completely unvoiced. She has no dialogue at all in that entire episode. <laughs> I mean, I, now that I think about it, that's true. But, like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because, yeah. yeah, she's... It's weird. This show wants to have an interest in politics, but the character who is most... Like, they do put her in the right place at Orb where she should be doing yeah. her job. Although, I think there's an open question about why is she the chairman of Orb? Because isn't... Was she elected to that position? Because she is 18. And it's like, was it just because she's the daughter of her dad? Okay, so this show has no actual conception yeah. of this. It's... It really, like, and you see this in the initial arc with the Saren characters, the, that family. Yeah. Is this some kind of, like, dis democracy or is it a monarchy, like, aristocracy system? Because she's talking about doing a political marriage, which is not something in, like, really right. any governments on Earth anymore, but let alone, like, like uh, democracies or something. So, like, she is the, they call her the chief representative. And I'm trying to figure out, is this, like, a constitutional monarchy system where she is nominally the head of state but has no actual power and is she trying to do the political marriage to get power or is she actually the elected duly elected chairman in which case she has no need for a political marriage right because she could just tell that family to go fuck off if she doesn't like what they're doing it's like my impression is based on like the setting it should be a democracy it doesn't make it any sense that it's some sort of like imperial family or some bullshit like that um and yet I mean, what the show wants to do, obviously, is just have her be a princess character and do, like, a yeah. very tropey princess story. And it's where you feel like this show gives no shits about its own politics because it, it doesn't, like, think about that at all. It never considers... No. It doesn't make any sense that she's the leader of Orb, necessarily. Like, it, it shouldn't be some sort of monarchy. 
it's supposed to be a democracy, clearly. Like, a monarchy doesn't make any sense for, like, the values that Orb is meant to represent. Basically, every woman on this show gets relinaed. Yeah. Uh, and she definitely gets relinaed. Uh, and it's bad. It's not as bad as Lacus and her Relina ing because at least Kagali like learns from her mistakes and does do some helpful shit at the end of the show. And she says has dialogue that's not just Aslan, although she does say Aslan a lot, but she has other lines of dialogue too, which is nice. Yeah. They also just completely abandon the romantic aspect of yeah. both couples from the original show, like Othrin and Kagali a little bit. He gives her that ring and all that stuff, but it never really comes back at the end. Kira and Lacus are completely sexless, and like I don't need it to be the focus of the show, but it was like a, a, a immense part of Seed's appeal. Yeah, as you outlined last time, it brings in some of this shojo manga quality to Gundam, and it's just gone. Yeah, it's just they completely get rid of it. Um, and this is where with Kagali, it's worth talking about. This is where one of like the sort of Controversy is maybe too strong for it, but like one of like the sort of like weird things behind the scenes that we don't know what is going on. But but so there are lots of rumors about like ah this happened and that happened, and it means that the director doesn't like the actress that played um, Kagali, who is voice name by name uh, Naomi Shindo. Um, and there's no obviously like nobody has talked about whether or not that's true. It is to me very conspicuous that she is not. There's no voice lines at all in episode 51, right? She is, this is like one of like the big like kind of slaps in the face of the characters that Othran is with mating in that epilogue scene um, instead of with Kogli, even though the epilogue scene takes place in fucking Orb where Kogli is. Um, it's like, that seems, I, I don't think that anyone could possibly be invested in the romantic pairing, pairing of Othran and mating. And yet that seems like what the show thinks based yeah. on the pairing of the epilogue. Um, and so then also Naomi Shindo did not return to voice the character until 2012. And so in all the like video games and other spin-off media that happened after Seed Destiny, in games that had like characters that are like way lower on the totem pole than, than Kagali and were there and were fully voiced, um, Kagali was either not there or the character was there, but just conspicuously didn't, was not voiced at all. And then in 2012, she, and since she has now continued to voice the character, but there's this like weird period and there's been no official statement. Nobody, no, there's no like official reason why she just did not voice the character. So we don't know if that's a contractual thing or if she didn't like the direction of the character or what. Yeah, no idea. Um, it's just very conspicuous that some, it feels like something weird happened. We don't know what. Because um, we do know that some characters, some actors were displeased with this show. The actor who voiced Sheen yes. has publicly talked yeah, about the, that. Yeah, the, the actor that voiced Sheen, since I forgot to bring it up, um, he did have a quote. Um, this was for one of the Super Robot Wars games, which is a big like crossover franchise that has a lot of story stuff. And so for Super Robot Wars Z, I think it is, that was the first one that had Sea Destiny. On the website, uh, Kenichi Suzumoto talked about how he liked the version of the character in the game. Um, this is a quote that gets like very like mistranslated in the West as being like way more like direct than what it is. But he effectively says that um, the version of Sheen that you get in this game is the version of scene of Sheen that the director Fukuda originally envisioned or was like was trying to pursue, and that also like exists in me. Um, and that's what he said is like, and that version of Sheen specifically has that kind of turn near the end of the story, from what I understand, where he becomes more active, self-reflective, and he ultimately, like, fights against Durandal. Um, okay. That's what happens in this kind of, like, what-if version of the story in the game. Um, so we do know that, with specifically, at least with him, Suva Suzumura, it's not a very direct statement, but if you read between the lines, like, that is a more normal thing than the, like, blog post of the dude just fucking, like, going ham on the director and the writer. It's just, like, it's very politely said, but, it, like, reading between the lines, it feels like a, he probably did not really like where the character went, and it was probably not what he thought the character was going to be like in that last section of the show. Yeah, I mean, probably he gets into the voice booth and like, all right, today you're recording the last couple episodes. And he's like, why is all my dialogue in the final script me crying? Don't I do anything? Uh, no, you don't do anything. Do I get to have another scene with Durandal in the last, like, ten episodes of the show? No, nope, you're just sort of getting beaten in fights now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Okay, um, who else do we need to talk about from the story? Okay, I want to call out a character I like. 
Okay. And then I want to talk about how they fuck her. <laughs> yeah. Captain Gladys is awesome. Yes. And I was never a huge Captain Ramius fan. I think she's kind of bland in the original show. She's fine. She's also kind of a wet noodle. But I really like Captain Gladys. She is such a good captain character. She's so cool. As as Captain Ramius is another woman who they make really fucking stupid in this show. Yeah. Like, she just keeps making mistakes. She has this dumb fucking moment where they're attacking the Archangel. Like, Why would they want to attack us after we attacked them several times? Yeah. Yeah. But Captain Gladys is just, she is a steady hand on the rail of this show, and I love her. And then inexplicably in the final episode, she decides she needs to go die with Durandal, and her last line is, oh, you're such a rascal, and then dies. And it is the most, maybe the most sexist thing in all of Gundam. Like, yeah. it takes, it's like they looked at Nina Purpleton and they're like, huh. They got, they ain't got shit. Yeah, it's really bad, because I agree with you. Like, I really like Gladys as a captain character, um... Like, she's, she doesn't have, like, much of a, a character arc necessarily, but she's one of the best captains, I think, in that more kind of, like, background role. Like a Bright in a Zeta Gundam or something like that, yeah. where it's like, they're not super active all the time, but, like, as a presence on the bridge and for a, as a, like, steady rock for the other characters to bounce off of, she's really good. She's also voiced by a, a Gundam veteran, uh, Mami Koyama, who's probably the most notable as the voice of, um, uh, not Mineva... Zabi, Cassilia Zabi in yeah. the original Gundam, and then Karen also in Double uh, O, not Double O eighty in O eight MS team. Yes. a lot of names to keep track of now. That were this I definitely remember Gundam. her. She's yeah, she's yeah. been in lots of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. she's really great uh, performance, and yeah, a very good character with a just like phenomenally dumb fucking ending. Like yeah, where, all like, of her stuff in the last episode is terrible. As she's there cradling Durandal, you also learn because she tells Kira that she has a kid. And I guess she's just abandoning that kid. And she yes! Says, I forgot about that. It's like the funniest line in Gundam where there's this whole, like, really weirdly in the background subplot where she and Durandal had some sort of relationship in the past that seems to be some sort of on and off thing now. Which is introduced in a recap episode. Yes, in a recap episode you have one scene that is like, I think it's supposed to be Durandal's motivation, but it doesn't connect to anything. So I don't really understand why it's important. But where she want, like, wants to be in a relationship with Durandal, but the way that the plants work is, you know, coordinators, it's like you want to have a kid and we need to control the population so you can only be with, like, this person. And so she marries and has a kid with this other guy, um, which feels backwards because it feels like, well, then that Durandal should probably do something that's not the Destiny plan. Because what you've experienced is a consequence exactly of what the Destiny plan is going to do to people where someone else has decided who your romantic partner is. I don't just don't I just don't understand what that plot point is supposed to do. It is buried in a fucking recap episode though. And then you get very occasionally Gladys like she has like in the last couple of episodes she has like a picture or something of a kid. She looks at once or twice that you're supposed to be like I guess that's her kid. And in the last episode she's like tell Captain Ramius that I have a son and to maybe pop in once in a while and visit him. And I watch that scene and I'm like I feel like Kita it's not the dramatically appropriate thing to do but Kita should just be like I mean, are you sure? Are you sure? I feel like maybe you should probably live so that you can raise your, like, five-year-old son. Like You can come. My Gundam's got yeah. room. You want to come? It's like, okay. It's okay. You can live. Like, trust me, that dude is an asshole. Like, come on, let's go. Um, it's it's just so, like, I get what the show is trying to do with this, like, dumb sexist bullshit. I, but it is, like, fucking hilarious. I have the last lines of her. Yeah. As the ship blows up, she goes, You're such a rascal. But truly, I guess it can't be helped. It just shows that it was destiny for you and I. <laughs> That's right. Never has a character been so backstabbed in the history of Gundam. Good God, yeah. that is such a sexist, awful ending. The only way that that line could be worse is if she said the English word destiny um, there yeah. instead of, I think she says unmei, which is like the Japanese word right. for destiny. Um, but yeah. it's like just to get the full title drop properly, even in the Japanese version, would have been great. Any other characters we need to break down? Um, we can talk about Ray really quick. Oh yeah, he's, he's Ray the Barrel. Yeah, Ray the Barrel. Um, he's he's a clone of Raul Cruze. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's something they could have done there. I think, I think that in the final episode, one of the only flickers of something because that final episode is so bad. <laughs> But the one flicker of something where I'm like, there could have been something here is him sh shooting Durandal. Like, if you actually built that, like, this guy was like a father to him. He was manipulated. He's this guy who's kind of been poisoning Sheen. Like, if you did the right version of that scene where Sheen is there in that scene, and, like, Ray had to choose between the two of them, and if Ray and Sheen had been in a more active dialogue with one another throughout, 
there's something there. Yes, I think like I love the line that Ray has where he says like the tomorrow that he's speaking of is is just too tempting, right? Yeah. It's like the the promise of a tomorrow which Ray has never really had is too tempting. The problem is that that concept is literally introduced in that episode. Yeah. Right? It's like, just comes the fuck out of nowhere. The show is like leaning on this idea that like the friendship and relationship between Ray and Sheen is much more strong than what it actually comes across on in the show. Yeah. But there's so, it's just another yes. thing where there's so much potential because he is this clone who is dying, who thinks he is fighting for a righteous cause, who is gradually, could be gradually deprogrammed. Instead, it's very sudden deprogramming. Like, there's so much potential there. Like, that last scene should be, and in my stupid little fanfic I'm working on, which is really just a thought project for me to work yeah. through my feelings, the final scene would be Sheen with the other characters there and the rest of them would fucking die and then Sheen would be leaving and like carrying on their legacy but like one Gladys wouldn't die willingly yeah <laughs> and like Ray it would be much more of like a fight of, of ideology between them and stuff and I realized as I said we were almost out of characters we didn't talk about the other uh, clone boy who's not actually a clone boy I was wrong oh, yes. we gotta talk about uh, 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 Mula Flaga. What's his name? Neo Roanoke. Neo, Neo Roanoke. Jonathan, you have no idea how hard it was to record the Gundam Sea podcast and talk about Moose death, knowing that they out of nowhere bring him back in the sequel. And it's just like I had to bite my tongue so hard because I rem I don't remember what it was, but I almost said something when we were talking about his death. I was like, wait, I can't say that because Jonathan will figure out that this. What is like an incredible great moment in what is a great climax for a Gundam show. Moose's death, I think, is so effective um, because it paired with like Tartarla's death and all that in that episode. Because um, they, they, it has a proper like lots of people die ending. Yeah, and it's like such a great moment in Gundam Seed. And again, I think in context, watching it in Gundam Seed when I rewatched it, it did not actually affect my enjoyment of that moment, knowing that he somehow bullshit survives in the sequel. But it was very hard to talk about on a podcast and not say, by the way he comes back <laughs> so but here's what's even funnier is we had this twitter exchange because yeah. i was tweeting about him because i mean let's just back up for a second he has the weirdest arc they do not know what they want to do with phantom pain at any point he so i guess in the like larger meta fiction he's working for durandal is that ever or uh, i don't think he knows that i think it's okay. more that durandal is like manipulating things okay such that really he is working towards Durandal's ultimate aims. Okay. Um, like, I think, for instance, I think the implication is that Durandal is the person who, wh however this information got disseminated, who made the decision to have Stella be the pilot of the De Destroy Gundam. Yeah. Um, and that kind of stuff. So it's like, somehow through, like, the web, he's manipulating things um, okay. that Neo Roanoke's, like, Splinter Group is kind of doing things for Durandal. Yeah. Okay. So, so Neo is our Shark clone for this show. I don't think the show needed a shark clone. I don't know why they did that. But yeah. they decided the show needed a shark clone. I do like this helmet. It's a cool-ass helmet. I like that it just has no eyepiece whatsoever. Yeah. Like, even even Rao's was pretty silly, because I don't know how he saw through it. But this is just, I guess he's full-on blind in that thing, which is great. And, you know, I will say, as a, as a shark clone voice, this is... Uh, it's not Tomikazu Seki. It's Tomi something else Seki. It's the guy who did no, uh, duo in... Uh, hold on. I'm, remember, I'm forgetting... It's, uh, it was, I'm pretty sure it's yeah. the guy who also did Duo in uh, Gundam Wing, and obviously it's it's Mula Flaga. No, it's the opposite. It's it's Zex from Gundam, Gundam Wing. Wing. Oh, okay, Duo right. was Ray or oh, is okay. Ray slash um, uh, okay. Rally Cruiser. I have it the other yeah. way then. Yeah, but anyway, it's a great voice and it's a yeah. great Shark Clone voice, and he's like entertaining when he's on screen. But then they reach this point in the the episode. Stella is when the Archangel finds him and and like destroy his ship, and then they they bring him on board. And then they just don't know what to do with him, and they turn him back into Mu. But in the middle of that, I, I was just under the assumption through a lot of this, because I saw Mu La Flaga disintegrate. Yeah. And I even went back on Twitter when we were having this Twitter exchange, Sean, and I went back to that episode and I screen-capped it to prove to myself that they showed a scenario from which no one could reasonably survive. He's in space, he's disintegrated, and there's a thermonuclear explosion. He is fucking dead. And so it just didn't even enter my mind that he's actually Mula Flaga. What I thought, because in the fiction of Gundam Seed, Ra Da Flaga, or whatever his name is, yeah. his dad, was cloned a bunch. That's where Ray comes from. That's where Rao comes from. 
like, I thought it was just another clone. And that's how they were manipulating him, because clones get manipulated, and it seemed like it was thematically keeping with Ray. So, like, I don't think I was stupid for thinking any of this. Oh, no. But, no. like, so, so I tweeted this thing about him being a clone, and, like, oh, that's kind of interesting that, like, he has the face of someone that these characters loved, but they don't have that anymore. That could be something interesting. And then you tweeted me, and you said, you did. I so, just did dot, 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 clone, question mark. Yeah, and I went, what? And then I started Googling, and I'm like, no, no, no. And then you sent me this thing. I was like, look, he has scars. And I tweeted back my experience. I said, scars? His body was disintegrated. How is that supposed to be a clue? Yeah, so from my perspective, that that Twitter conversation was... Um, because I, I am trying never to... I don't want to like respond to your Gundam tweets as you're experiencing the show, because I don't want to put undue influence yes. on your experience. And and it's it's impossible that maybe like the the, I mean the most explicit they get is there's a flashback to where you see him like covered in bandages or whatever, um and Jabril or whoever it is yes. um or the, I think maybe it's the fucker from Gundam Seed like has him or whatever and they have saved him from space somehow um and and brought him back to life and fucked with his memories maybe you hadn't hit that scene yet maybe you had and it just it's like. I mean, it's like 30 seconds. Like, it's very easy to like... Yeah. Not Maybe really I saw it and my brain couldn't accept it because Moo was... Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I was like, if there's a chance that Jonathan... Like, there's no way that you would know for sure that that's what it's supposed to be. But I couldn't... I couldn't let that inf piece of information slide by me because I'm like, this is too funny. <laughs> It's so funny. And, but it, it was a great moment of self-reflection of where I... It's hard for me to remember what my reaction was when I originally watched See Destiny, but I don't have a memory of interpreting it as a clone thing, even though that makes so much more sense. <laughs> I was trying to remember, like, well, why didn't... Wouldn't I have thought that? And then I looked at the character, I'm like, it's the scar. <laughs> like, it, like, as stupid as it is, as little sense it makes, I'm like... <laughs> Well, the only reason he would have a scar is if he was the original Moo. Like, if he was a clone, he wouldn't have the scar. And it's like, I think that's the reason why I always assumed it was supposed to be just Moo LaFlaga. Even when it's like, it's a phenomenally stupid fucking thing that actually makes no sense. But on the level that, of stupid that Seed Destiny is constantly operating at, it, it makes sense for Seed I Destiny. Mean, this, this is a world where Kira and Othran both are in the middle of thermonuclear explosions, and then they have a little bandage around their head. So I guess that makes sense, that he would have little scars on his face. Yep, he has, he has like one X scar on his cheek, basically. Yeah, from, from space disintegration, yeah. you get a little scar on the cheek. You know, the, the surgery in the future is really fucking good. Medical yeah. technology has come a very long way. Um, but yeah, other than that, the character is utterly unremarkable. Um, the one thing about him that, like, really pissed me off is in the last episode, they do that, like, call back to Moo's death, where it's, like, the same scenario, but now he's in the Akatsuki, which can, like, reflect beams. Apparently, even when it's a fucking, like, battleship's main cannon, it's not just, like, a beam rifle, and he, and he lives and he has his lines, like, I'm the man who makes the impossible possible, right? And I'm like, oh, fuck off. What I really Get wanted fucked. to have I was I was laughing so hard because what I was prepared for was him to just die again. That would have been so funny if he just does it again and then Murray is like, no! Oh, I guess I've already lived through this. I, yeah. That's not that bad. Yeah, no. I mean, it is the most fan service -y bullshit that he dies and then he gets to come back and Ramius gets to have her boyfriend again because that's yeah. all she wants because she's a woman and this show hates women. Yeah. It's really bad. It's really bad. Uh, a couple of other characters uh, we haven't really talked about. I don't think we need to talk about a lot, but Luna Maria, she's there. She's there. She's, she's, she's the there interest. to get put into a very like unconvincing relationship with Sheen. Um, in like the, it's like in the last ten episodes. Um, and I was kind of shocked watching it again how late that's introduced yeah. because it's something I remembered about the show. Because like, those two actors are married, right? And they yes. often play couples. Yeah. So that's Maya Sakamoto. Um, she and Kenichi Suzumura um are got married I think in 2012, and they like. This was the first show, I believe, that they, like, were kind of paired up on and, like, played two major roles that are in a lot of scenes together. And they're, like, sort of, like, infamous of... I don't know if the anime industry does it on purpose. I don't know if it's just because they really work well that way. Um, but they are, like, always in shows together. And they're always, like, either a couple or really prominent characters that are in a lot of scenes together. I literally just watched the finished watching the Fate Grand Order anime, like, yesterday. Which has those two characters in that... Or those two actors in that same scenario... 
Um, they are also uh, Zax and Aerith from Final Fantasy VII and the Crisis Core. Well, you know, they can commute to the studio together. It really yeah. it's an economic savings for them. Yeah. It's just something I find... I, I should, really should just look up an interview with them because it's a scenario I find very funny because once you notice it, you can never stop noticing it because it really, if you watch enough anime or play enough games from Japan, like it does happen freak, freakishly often. Um, that's awesome. So it's the best part of Luna Maria in the show is that it's like, that's like a fun trivia question, right? It's yeah. like, that's the time when it happened I think Maya Sakamoto is like a really good actress I don't think this is necessarily like her best role it's not um, a, I mean she's yeah. there she's in the mobile suit she is the one who fails to shoot down Jabril's craft at point blank range which is a really funny piece yeah. of animation um, so yeah I uh, you know women aren't good mobile suit pilots in this show for some reason yeah because there's also that it has like the whole bad early stuff of her admitting both like having a crush on Othra. Oh, yeah. and it's just like it's that way where it's like every female character in the show, with the exception maybe of, of Gladys, like is filtered through their relationship with a man. It's not like, not the exception of Gladys. Yeah, we, in the end, yeah, not by the end, right? But for a lot of the show, it feels like man, she's like the exception to the rule, and then yes. you get to the end is like no, the rule has no exceptions. Yes, in Gundam Sea Destiny. No, I mean, I, and I think Seed has its own gender problems. I, I don't know if we mentioned it on the podcast how annoyed Seed makes me by all the stuff it does with, like, Captain Ramius's bouncing right. breasts yeah, during the scenes. Yeah, that, like, the it's, bad, like, It's very Hideaki Hano, yeah. like, Eva, and it annoys me. And they continue to use that exact same clip in Seed Destiny as well. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. This show's even worse. This is, yeah. Uh, trust me, we do not just call out Eva when it is sexist. Gundam can be sexist. This is very sexist, Gundam. Yeah. We are a long way from, like, Tomino's interesting, if flawed, but improving explorations of gender yeah. that, that, that culminate in the beauty of Turn A Gundam. We're a long way from that. Yeah. And then we have my favorite character in Gundam Sea Destiny. A character I forgot existed, but I, I, like, laughed so hard at his whole arc, which is Heine Westenfluss. Who is the guy who joins the oh, crew yeah. <laughs> of the Minerva for a grand total of two episodes, and it is the funniest fucking thing ever. I forgot this character existed entirely when he popped up and he joined the crew of the Minerva. I'm like, who is this guy? How did I forget someone who literally like joined the crew of the ship and then he dies in the next episode? Um, he's voiced by TM Revolution, who is the guy who sings the like a lot of the the opening themes and stuff like that. Um, which is a good little detail. And he has the best death scene in any Gundam show where he has that whole fight. He's in his fucking Zaku. They have the gall to give him a Rambo Rao quote where he has this like, or he's in a goof, sorry. And he says like, this isn't a Zaku. This isn't a Zaku, which is like the a direct quote from one of Rambo Rao's sort of memed lines from the original show. Um, and then he's killed in the stupidest way possible, where Stella is in her metal Gururumon and is, like, going to go try to kill Kida. And then Haina, with his, like, in the goof, with his back turned, just sort of slowly drifts in the way and just gets cut in half. Um, and then you get the best shot in all of Gundam, which is the goof explodes, and then a picture of Haina, like, half-transparency, like, overlooking the battlefield with him smiling, just overlaid on the shot. <laughs> and it's, like, it's the kind of shit that fucking Gintama would do, where it just kills <laughs> off, like, a random character in one throwaway episode, and was like, no! And he, like, is up there, and he's, like, smiles, and, like, it's, like, fucking shooting star streaks across the night sky like it is the funniest shit ever you know i didn't even watch that episode that long ago and if you put a gun to my head and asked me who heino weston Fuss was i would not have remembered it is such a nothing character oh my god and they just try to give him this big dramatic death and it's like the most wet fart in the history of gundam oh uh. my god so we should probably start ra wrapping up. Are there any other characters before? I have kind of a couple little things no. I think we should clear up. So let's make fun of the final episode a little more. Yes. I think we've touched on everything enough. That final episode, especially in its original form, just the episode 50, the final power, yeah. is one of the worst things ever. It is terribly animated. It is terribly directed. It is incoherent in its action yeah. and direction of what people are doing. It just out of the fucking blue brings in another like a fucking death star asteroid that he's built for i don't know why i don't know why but he has a death star asteroid um the the final scene on the on the the ship with with uh durandal is clearly supposed to be a flashback to this or a uh a, a reference to the scene in zeta gundam where you have camille and char and and 
uh, everybody on the like sh- the little theater stage oh, yeah, together, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's bad and it doesn't work. Sheen is crying on the moon. Um, nobody, nobody gets a resolution. It's just yeah. the closest you get is I think you would say Ray gets a resolution. It's not great, but it, you know, he gets it. And then everyone else, and I guess Durandal and Gladys do because they fucking die. Yeah, but like it's not a good resolution. Durandal does not like act in character, and neither does Gladys. And then everyone else just. They just like basically it's like how dumb people want Lord of the Rings to end where the ring dissolves and then it smash cuts to credits and you never see the characters again. Yeah. That's how this ends and it is just a giant middle finger to the audience and it is awful and bad and and Gundam has never and probably never will be as bad as that episode. Yeah, it's a it is a legendarily bad uh final episode. As you said, it's it's everything is so compressed into this little tiny like <laughs> fucking episode where it feels like it's like the last five episodes of Zeta Gundam stuffed into one. It's yes. fucking absurd. None, nothing in terms of payoff feels like it lands because all the fights are like two seconds long. Sheen gets defeated by Othran literally in like two exchanges and that's it. And then he's crying on the moon. Um, they give the fucking last scene to Kira and Durandal in their like confrontation um, in that scene, which is just makes no sense. It's the, horribly written. Th- these are two characters that have never seen each other, never spoken to each other, who only know about each other in like concept, um, but have but have never had any direct communication. And in the original episode fifty version, Othran's not there. Sheen is never there. There's no like confrontation Sheen has with Durandal at any point. Um, and it's just like this is like the worst possible way you could wrap up this show. Like it, nothing about it works uh, at any level. It's it's so bad. Like, it, it's, and it's not just the story. It really is, like, the animation is threadbare. Yeah. The direction is confusing. It's, it's horribly edited. And here's the thing. The episode 51 version, in some ways, is worse. Yeah. Like, I think uh-huh. the... I couldn't really pinpoint to you what's new in it, except the epilogue and Othran being there at the end. But it, it is longer... I know there's new stuff in there, but it is edited in such an incoherent way that it just felt like the same shitty episode, but longer. It is it is nominally better because it has an ending. It's yeah. not a good ending, but it is an ending. But it's not better in any other sense. In some ways, it's worse. Yeah, this was something that I was really fascinated by because I had never watched the original episode 50. And so I had no context for what was different. So when I watched it, I was like shocked at... This is basically what I remember the ending being just without the epilogue. Like, that, maybe I'm remembering wrong. And then I watched the extended version of the ending, which is twice as long. It is the length of two episodes. But all that is notably different is the epilogue. Um, and it, they just waste a bunch of the... Because the epilogue is about eight minutes long. So there's a lot of time that's kind of, like, unaccounted for. Most of it is just kind of wasted. Because there's a bunch of... There's a long, like prologue section where they like kind of recap a bunch of stuff from the show and that's like three to five minutes long and then there are a lot of little cutaways and added in moments that are not character based they're like here's like one other like random mobile sheet getting blown up here's like the fucking like fake black tri stars they show up like out of nowhere in that last section of the show there's like new footage dedicated to them there is very little in the way of new footage in the existing material from episode 50 that uses any of the major characters. Um, and it's just like, it feels like such a wasted opportunity because it doesn't change much other than that it adds the epilogue. Everything else is more or less identical down to the incoherent editing, which is mostly the same from the original episode 50. Yeah, and then yeah. the epilogue, like it is an ending. It has denouements. It is still utterly frustrating because what it is is just a recapitulation of the ending of Gundam Seed yeah. where Locus declares a ceasefire and then Kogali with Orb comes in to do the treaty. Yeah, without saying anything. You yeah. just get told by Locus that that is what has happened with Kogali. Yes. And so it's just, okay, we're back to where we started, literally, because this is what it was at the end of Gundam Seed. So I guess this will all happen again. Uh, and then it's everyone at the little grave site and the flowers thing. And there's some very bad dialogue. And then Kira offers uh, absolution to, to uh, Sheen, uh, Sheen who, who bows at Jesus Yamato's feet. Yeah, and that's it. Luna Maria sees her sister alive for the first time since she thought that her sister was dead. That happens in the epilogue and is not really commented on. Um, <laughs> Othran shows up with Mating instead of uh, Kogli, implying presumably there's some sort of romantic relationship there because that's how the characters are paired with their romantic partner. It's like, that's they're, out of fucking nowhere. They're in a thruple now. Kogli yeah. is out of there, but I just, I'm going to imagine that it's a polyamorous. Yeah. 
Um, but they they all live together. It's a thruple. Kagali has discovered her bisexuality. Um, I think it feels weird because I don't know how old Maiden is supposed to be, but she seems like she's like fourteen or fifteen years old. Oh no, it's, it's like, totally yeah. Kagali has lowered the age of consent in Orb to make this okay, uh, but it's fucked up. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's yeah the episode fifty one. I was just shocked at how like man, it's just not much better. Um, and in one way where I feel like it is hilarious. That it's like, I don't know if it is better at the, with this or worse with this. But the way that they very haphazardly shove Othron into that scene with Durandal. It's so I, funny. I find so funny. I took a bunch of screen caps because I was like, because when I was watching it, I was like, did they just take the existing shots and just draw Othron into it? And there are a couple of original shots, but mostly, Jonathan, it is just... <laughs> original shots from the show <laughs> with Othrin just drawn into them like yeah. really killing the framing of most of the shots um, so I'll, I will post funny. these on Twitter when the podcast goes up also um, but they do them in a bunch of the long shots so you can see here Othrin yeah. is drawn in Jonathan um, this is another one where they draw Othrin in on like the very edge of the screen he's barely in the shot um, I, I put one in here again these will be on my Twitter um, that I say, like they did do some original shots that replaced the old shots. It's like there's at least one that's like, hey, they drew something new for this one. Um, and then my favorite one, which is a shot that like is utterly destroyed by the inclusion of Arthron because it's supposed to be Kita in the foreground walking off camera, and you're supposed to be looking at Talia and Durandal in the background because of the next shot cuts to them, and they just shove Arthron into the middle of the frame, utterly destroying the whole purpose of the shot. And it is so funny the way that like Arthron is there and he like has lines, but they don't like. Nobody reacts to his presence anyway. <laughs> and the what it reminded me of is when you play something like the Walking Dead Telltale game or like maybe Mass Effect or something like that, where you have a character who like <laughs> through your narrative choices could have been killed. Um, and so when they appear in a story scene, they now no longer can have any real presence because there's a version of the scene that's mostly identical that just doesn't have them there. So it's just like he's a weird ghost, a specter that is just floating around the edges, just dropped into a scene that was not written to have him in it. And it's like the cheapest shit I have ever seen in an anime. It's so bad. It does not work. No, it does not work, but it, it did make me laugh really hard. It's very funny. Uh, okay, so we hidden uh, quickly on like a lighter subject, the theme songs for this show. Yes. I've got to talk about those. They're, the the opening themes all suck except for Ignited. I think Ignited by TM Revolution. I like. I think I might like that even more than the first seed opening. I I know that's probably controversial, but I think Ignited is a fucking killer opening. It's good. All of Team Revolution stuff for again seed yeah. is very good. Um, yeah, I think like the other openings are like mostly like unremarkable to me. Other than the last one is in contention with the last theme from Turn A Gundam as like one the of the worst yeah. Gundam OPs ever. Uh, so bad that they replaced it in the HD version yeah. with Vestige, which is the TM Revolution insert song for this show, which is great. Vestige yeah. is one of their best things, and it works much better as a theme song. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's called Wings of Words by Chemistry. Chemistry have done other good openings, but that one fucking sucks. I mean, it mostly feels like they accidentally ordered uh, five endings theme songs and only three opening theme songs. They're like, well, we got to throw an ending theme song as the opener. Yeah. Because it's like not written as an opening theme song. It's no. very awkward. It's very awkward. Yeah, it's awful. Uh, it's not as annoying as Century Color, so I will call Century Color still the worst one because it also replaced fucking Turn A Turn. Yes. It, yeah, because Century Color is a bad theme in a good show. This is a yeah. bad theme in a bad show, so yeah. who cares? Uh, but I I do like all the endings. I don't love them all, but just the, the basic thing of, they still do this from Seed, where the ending starts over the final yeah. minutes uh, or seconds of the show, is still great. And and the ending song Life Goes On by Mika Arisaka is phenomenal. I love it. It's the one that goes... Da -na 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 -da -na -da -da -na -na. Yes, it's yeah. so good. It's such a great high energy closing for that like second core. It's, it's great. The first ending reason is like a cheap knockoff of the first ending from the first show. But still, uh, mostly they work. I do like the last one, You Resemble Me. That one's yes, pretty good. Because that one's... It's basically um, a sequel song to Anani Shodatami, the first ending yeah. from the original show. Because that's... I they're think both that's, seesaw. Yeah, yeah, they're both seesaw, so that's Yuki Kazuya. Um, and then they also did um, an insert song that's kind of like 
Wheels of Dawn that's like Door of Flame or something like that yeah. um, as well. That's a very good insert song. Yeah. So, and I, I think the score is even better than the one mm -hmm. for Seed because it's got all the good Seed stuff and I think a lot of the new stuff is well written. Uh, it's all timed very well. Um, musically, this show is, is very good other than some boring openings. Yeah, yeah. Overall, I think the soundtrack is, is great. Like, the soundtrack does a lot of work in yes. a lot of places of the show to sell things that I think would not work at all if the music was not as good as it is. That's 100% true. Yep. Yeah. All right. Anything else to say about Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Destiny before we call it a day? I feel like we gave the people what they wanted. I don't know how anyone's not satisfied with this. I feel very satisfied. I feel a true sense of relief, John, <laughs> to, like... Imagine having this bottled up in you for five years. It just yeah. was not healthy. Like we, we this I, podcast needed to happen one one way or another. I think it's funny. We're almost at three and a half hours, and this feels like it has the content of about a five hour podcast in it. Yeah, we were off like a fucking bottle rocket through uh -huh. this whole thing. This is a high energy podcast. High energy podcast, but man, see destiny. It's a it's a hell of a thing. I look forward to having a lot more time in my day now, just not having to like think about it ever. <laughs> Because it's offloaded into the... Yes, into yeah, the I've, I've created my Seed Destiny thing. It's out there. I've, like, backed up my feelings on it. So now <laughs> it doesn't have to occupy space in my actual brain. This show is a mystery wrapped in an enigma. Yep. Uh, but, man, we still love Gundam. And we've got some good stuff coming up. So yes. the next full show we have is Gundam Double Zero. But that will not be the next episode. Because between uh, Seed Destiny and Gundam Double Zero... Yoshiyuki Tomino came back, mm -hmm. and he did a trilogy called Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, a new translation. And we did an episode all about the original Gundam trilogy, but we never did it for Zeta, and neither of us have watched those movies in full. Yep. I, have, I have seen the newly animated footage, so I know like the changes they've made and seen that stuff, but I've never actually sat through and watched them as movies, so yeah. I'm... Excited to do that. So yeah. they're next up in the chronology. So our next episode, which hopefully will be later this month or in February, because uh, it'll be easier to watch. Yes. Yeah. Three 90-minute movies. Uh, will be the Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam Trilogy. You can get that on DVD or Blu-ray in the States. I don't think it's streaming anywhere, but it's easy to find. Um, and actually, one thing that's nice is from here on out, all the Gundam shows are on Crunchyroll. Yes. So yeah. that'll be a lot easier for everybody involved. Yeah, and there's no HD recut version. No. All that bullshit's done now. Let's yeah. see. Yeah. But we'll be back next time for Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, a new translation, which will also be interesting after the worst sequel ever in Seed Destiny to revisit one of the best sequels ever in this different form. Uh, these movies were also, if I'm not mistaken, very popular. When they yes, they out. did very well. Yeah. yeah. So I'm excited to give these a watch. Yes, I am Yes, I am also very excited to come full circle and revisit the best sequel in the history of Gundam to wash the fucking taste of Sea Destiny out of my goddamn mouth. <laughs>